Happy birthday, Owen! I purchased a new Pokemon game you love so much. And dinner tonight? Oh, the only gear you can eat. Can you imagine how awesome these games are going to be when we're grown-ups? Oh, and ice cream Pokemon. Well, it's not my cup of tea, but th that's not what I meant. Your total will be 60 US dollars, but if you pre-order the DLC for an additional 35 US dollars, you'll receive an Orenberry absolutely free. You're my son, and I will love you no matter what, but when are you gonna get a real job? Do you like Pokemon? Well, you probably do, at least a little bit, otherwise you wouldn't be watching this. And I probably do, at, at least a little bit, otherwise I wouldn't be making this, so... Let's finding out together with us just how much I like these main series games. You are currently watching the premium version of this Pokemon mainline series tier list. The full, the live version will be in the description, and all of this content is made possible by the mighty Patreons that you see on screen now. Thank you for your support. This tier list is kind of unique, because aside from the waifu tier list, this is the only one where it's actually just my opinion, bro. In almost every tier list, I'm the one talking at you, but it's not really me talking at you, I'm, I'm just the vector. Me and the chat, we're collaborating to find the truth, and as you know, chat is never wrong. <laughs> For example, in Scarlet and Violet in-game tier list, Flamigo, a Pokemon that I think is despicable, was ranked number one. And that's because under the criteria that I personally set for my in-game tier lists, Flamigo is the best. You can disagree, but you would be wrong. <laughs> so the fact that Flamigo is creatively bankrupt and I think should be removed from the game doesn't matter. It is the best in-game Pokemon, and you can't disagree without being incorrect. For this mainline game tier list, we can have wildly differing experiences, we can rank two games on the exact opposite end of the tier list, and we can both be right. Crazy! I'll tell you right now, this tier list is going to be wildly biased, because it is impossible for me to separate my opinion of these games from my life at the time I played these games. So the opinion is going to differ based on whether or not I paid for these games, or they were gifted to me, uh, whether or not I was generally happy when I played these games, innumerable factors that I cannot possibly list and that will be wildly different for you. For example, regarding Scarlet and Violet, Scarlet and Violet is a game that I paid $60 for and then played mostly in order to make content for this channel. Uh, in the end, I would say that if I lit my currency on fire, it probably would have been more viable because then at least I would have saved money on my energy bill. But your experience might be completely different. Maybe Director Omori himself came to your house, gave you the game for free, uh, then he gave you 10,000 US dollars cash, maybe he resurrected your beloved childhood dog, uh, then he injected you with a serum that wiped your memory of any game that came out in the past two decades, then he bonked you on the head to give you a mild concussion, asked you your opinion of the game, and then after running your statement through, I don't know, a couple layers of Google Translate and massaging the phrasing a little bit, I think at the end you might be able to come out with a statement that is vaguely positive about the game. See, we can have different experiences. What's my criteria for this list? How much I like the games. <laughs> that really is about it. I will talk more about it as I talk about each game, but it really is just my opinion, bro. Uh, now, let me be clear. I do think there is a difference between having rose-tinted glasses, not black glasses, and considering the environments games were released into. So for example, Ocarina of Time, usually considered the best game of all time. Is it the best game of all time in 2023? No. I think I can say that without getting Warlock Punch. But was it the best game ever when it was released in 1998? Yeah, I, I think so. 
so I'm usually going to be considering a game based on the environment it was released into. So you might see that new games that are better than older games might actually be ranked worse because they're worse relative to other games you could be playing. So what are the actual tiers? Well, you can see at the very top, we have HGSS tier. You'll never guess what game goes there. And those are games that I would say I would recommend to even non-Pokemon fans. Pretty good. Then we have A tier. I think that every Pokemon fan should play these games. Then we have B tier. I think these games are pretty good. You should probably play them if you're a Pokemon fan. Then we have C tier. I think I would recommend these games only to dedicated Pokemon fans. Otherwise, you could probably skip them. D tier. I think you could skip these games and not much would be lost. In fact, I would recommend that you skip them. And then at the bottom, we have Game Freak's Finest. These are games I think are so bad, you will no longer be a Pokemon fan. So don't play them if you like Pokemon. I feel like there aren't any Pokemon games that are truly bad games, just bad in relation to other entries. Interesting that you say that. I want to state now, all of these rankings are relative to other Pokemon games. Even the top entry on this list, if I had to go on a 1 to 10 scale, I'd, I'd probably give it like a 7. Pokemon games aren't that good. But when I say 7, I don't mean like a game journal is 7. I mean like, a 7 is pretty good. For me at least, a 5 would be a truly average experience. A game that, yeah, it was okay, but I probably wouldn't play it again. A 7 would be a game that I did enjoy, probably would play again. And a 10 would be a game that changed my life. Uh, so for me, a 10 would be maybe Xenoblade Chronicles 1, uh, certain moments of Final Fantasy 14, maybe the ending of Nier Automata. As you can see, I'm just weeb garbage. <laughs> what games would I consider a 1? Well, let's not spoil the tier list too early. If 10 out of 10, <laughs> if a 10 out of 10 changed your life, then Scarlet and Violet should be a 10 out of 10. <laughs> ah, I should be clear, change my life for the better. I should probably explain the, the games that will actually be ranking today. So these are all of what I at least consider to be the main series games. You'll probably notice four entries that maybe don't fit that definition. So those would be Pokemon Coliseum. Coliseum XD, the Let's Go games, and then Legends Arceus. Those are arguably spin-offs, but they didn't spin very far, right? I consider them to be mainline games because they have mainline battle mechanics, right? They're not exactly Pokemon Pinball. So I think it's fair to rank them with the rest of them, although I guess they get a little bit of an asterisk. And of course, we won't be talking about games like Pokemon Mystery Dungeon, which are just radically different. Mystery Dungeon is just a bizarro world where Surprise. Skitty is the best starter, you're mowing down hordes of innocence with bullet seed, and agility lets you ascend into untouchable godhood, so we're gonna have to do a totally separate video for that. So although this list is my opinion, there are live viewers here, and I want to give you guys the chance to also state your worthless opinions. So here's what we're going to do. When I rank a game, if you think that the ranking should be higher, please use Sichi no coin up or the up arrow to indicate that you think it should be higher. If you think the placement is just right, use how convenient uh, or the circle emote. If you think the ranking should be lower, then please use Sichi no coin down. Uh, or the down arrow. And that's how you can state your opinions. And I would ask that you do one emote once for each game. I'm not checking you, obviously I can't stop you from spamming, but I'm asking you not to. Also, Savancy in with 50 imported cheese memberships. I guess everyone has one now, so thank you. One emote, one vote, okay? Your votes won't actually change my opinion. But you can at least then easily see how my opinion differs from the majority or doesn't differ. Let's do a practice round just to see if democracy is a functioning system. I think Pokemon Scarlet and Violet is a bold step in the right direction for the franchise. 
technical issues aside, I would say that I really enjoyed my time with the game and I would recommend it to anyone, even those who are just looking to dip their toes into the Pokemon franchise for the first time. Definitely not one emote, one phone. Final notes before we start, because it is relevant to how I'll be ranking these games, I think I will mention the year each game was released and how old I was and what I was doing at the time, because that'll probably affect how I view these games. And just a note about version differences, most Pokemon games release three times, uh, the initial two version release and then the definitive version release. Usually the base versions will be ranked together because they're the same. I'll, I'll mention any differences that exist between the versions if they do exist, but I won't mention the fact that they have different catchable Pokemon because that's going to be true for all of them. And also it's not different content. It's just like cut content. I'm sure they make one version that has every Pokemon and they just rip stuff out. So I'm not going to mention that every time, but just know that it applies to everything. Before we start ranking, no spoilers for the list, but I'm guessing if you're watching this, you probably already agree with me. <laughs> but I think that there's going to be four rankings that are going to be controversial and one ranking that I think might surprise you. My final reminder to you, this list is my opinion. You don't have to agree with my choices, but I hope that by the end of this, you'll at least understand why I made them. That's pretty cool, right? <laughs> in real time, it's been just under an hour. Hopefully in the premium, it's been less than that. <laughs> but let's ranking together with us, starting with Pokemon Generation 1. There is going to be a lot to talk about for this one, so strap in. I think first we should start with a rundown of what games are actually in Generation 1 because this one in particular is very funky. This was back when Pokemon literally was a small indie company. They didn't do international releases, so there's a bunch of different versions. So the very first were Red and Green, which I believe released in Japan in 1995. We never got these. They created a blue version that was fixed. <laughs> And then that fixed version was split into the red and blue that we got in the West in 1998. I was four years old when I played them. We're not actually going to be talking about red and green here, but the differences between the red and green that they got and the red and blue that we got were that the select bug, the main one that completely destroys the game, has been fixed, and the sprites are less bad. <laughs> And also Blizzard got nerfed because Pokemon Green Blizzard was 90 accuracy, 120 base power, and had a 30% chance to freeze you. And freeze in Gen 1 was a super one-hit KO you never thought out, and you were just stuck there. It was horrible. Glad they nerfed it. How would I rank Pokemon Red and Blue? I would put it in... A tier. A 29-year-old, dressed as Red who also dresses as Charizard, likes Gen 1? I can't believe it. <laughs> I think that Gen 1 excels in three very unique categories. We're going to talk about those. So the first one is as a video game when it came out. So you'll notice that Pokemon is a cultural and financial behemoth, right? If you use Behemoth Blade, you do extra damage to it. But that wasn't always the case, right? Once upon a time, Game Freak was a small indie company. And the only reason it is too big to fail is because these games were so good. So if you're from my generation, I'm not talking about Pokemon generation, I, I mean like human generation, so millennial, I'm, I'm 29 years old. Everyone in my generation, even if you never played a Pokemon game in your life, knows about Pokemon because Pokemania was a real thing. These games were inescapable. The Pokemon company threw like cultural influence, they got their tendrils everywhere, probably using Constrict, turned my entire generation into like sleeper agents for the Pokemon company. You can be like living your life, like holding your child, and then you'll hear Pikachu. You'll just drop your worthless kid. Yeah, I remember Pikachu. Charmander's so overrated. 
only the weird kids picked Bulbasaur, I should purchase the new game. Like, it's crazy how the cultural memory of Pokemon has wormed its way into our consciousness. That's why they keep doing this Kanto pandering. If you didn't play these games, it's like hard to understand, but they're just trying to activate that sleeper agent programming. That's why they stuff Kanto into all this stuff. I guess it worked on me. Back in 1999 when these games released, the internet was a very different place. It existed, but it kind of sucked. Nowadays, not only can you go on the internet and watch other people play games, you can watch people talk about games that they played 25 years ago. <laughs> but back in the day, you had to actually play the games yourself or like go outside or like read a book. I mean, it was kind of a scary time. But back in elementary school, everyone had the Pokemon game. You were asking to trade. You were like lying to your friends about how you could use strength on a truck and catch Mew 3. Talking about the legend of missing no, which wasn't a legend, it was actually real, but you couldn't like look it up on the internet and know what was real and what was a hoax. You just had to try it for yourself. It was an incredible experience. You would like trade people the best parts of your Lunchable for like hot tips on where this certain Pokemon could be found. That was the elementary school economy, okay? Nowadays, all people care about is Minecraft and TikTok and Fortnite. Truly, the kids are hopeless. Somebody mentioned in the chat, Yo, dude, did you hear that if you trade Kadabra, it'll evolve into Alakazam? Shut up, Mark. I'm sure that's how four-year-old kids sounded. <laughs> but back in the day, stuff that we take for granted, like as common knowledge about the series, nobody knew that. Like, you didn't know that trade evolutions were a thing. It sounds like a scam, right? Trade me your Kadabra and I'll trim it for you, right? You didn't know that dragon types were weak to ice? You just had these invincible Barneys that were resistant to all of your starters moves. Pokemon really did take over culture. I remember going to a Pokemon party at Burger King where a bunch of kids had Pokemon cards and you could buy a gold-plated Charizard for $5. What a value. What about the game itself? Well, for a Game Boy game in 1999, it was actually, unironically, incredibly good. The so Pokemon, as you probably know, is an RPG game. Usually in RPGs, you have a party of maybe four people, maybe eight if you're crazy. But in Pokemon, you have a party of up to 150 that you can choose from. This is unprecedented freedom in team building. You had the power, even though in real life, you were a powerless little kid. You couldn't even decide when you wanted to go to sleep, but you could decide to pick Charmander and then lose five times to Brock. I would say that as games, Red and Blue were actually very solid RPG adventure games. The tutorial was incredibly brief. You delivered the parcel to Professor Oak and then I, that was it. You could kind of just do whatever you wanted. It was up to you to figure out what to do. I guess you could ask Mark from school about what to do, but he lied about Alakazam, so I don't know if I would trust him. Now, I could barely read at the time, and I vividly remember beating the Elite Four and then hearing about the champion and being super frustrated. I felt deceived because I knew that four meant one, two, three, four, and I had just done four battles. Why was there a fifth one? Cheated. We didn't even know that champions came after the Elite Four back then. It was a new thing. I think Kanto was pretty barren in story, making the region feel kind of empty. You write your own story, bro, which may be a stropium. The gameplay of Gen 1 is interesting. Uh, it was the first time, so not everything is going to be correct. So they got a lot of stuff wrong. <laughs> uh, balancing was not really a concept, so Psychic was just incredibly overpowered, and Poison was horrific despite the fact that like half the Pokemon were Poison types. And back in the day, quality of life there was no quality. <laughs> you wanted to use an HM, you had to open up the menu, select it, and then use it, and you could never forget them because there was no move deleter. You didn't even know what the base power or effects of moves were because it wasn't written anywhere. <laughs> Truly, it was kind of a dark time, although you could use flash. Move typings didn't really make any sense. Yeah, karate chop was a normal type move. <laughs> dark and steel didn't exist. Yeah, balancing could have been better, but thankfully it does get better later on. The graphics were 
existent? <laughs> you had to really use your imagination. Some of the sprites I think were kind of good. Some of them were not, especially the back sprites. Venusaur's back sprite was literally pixel salad. <laughs> you had to do a lot of the work on your own. It was kind of like a tabletop RPG in that you had to fill in a lot of the gaps for yourself. And the Game Boy did its best with its limited processing to try and display stuff for you. It tried. It didn't always succeed. All of that was one aspect of Gen 1. Gen 1 as it was back in the day. Another aspect that I think Gen 1 really excels at is Gen 1 today. Oh, I don't know if you saw that coming. So Gen 1, I think is so far removed from our current conception of a video game that playing it today is kind of like walking through a museum. It is so archaic and weird and janky that if you haven't played Gen 1, I think it is actually worth playing now just to see like, wow, people used to play games like this. The game is not very long. You can finish the entire thing in about maybe 10 hours in a casual playthrough. Uh, certainly less if you're using a guide. I think it's worth it. You can see how like bizarre and janky stuff used to be. It's like watching a 1920s movie like Seven Samurai. I don't think that movie came out in the 1920s. It'll take you about the same amount of time. Seven Samurai is like three hours long. You should watch Seven Samurai. The game might even literally be in black and white, depending on what device or setting you're playing it on. So many things we take for granted in the modern games just didn't exist in Gen 1, so somebody mentioned it in the chat. But the PC boxes is a thing. If you started with Gen 3, that's probably something you've never even thought of. But back in the day, you had to manually switch PC boxes, and if your current PC box was full, you couldn't even throw a Pokeball. That also existed in Gen 2. And that's the sort of stuff you can go back and experience for yourself. It's like not having indoor plumbing. <laughs> okay, it's not like that at all, but I think I'll leave that in. <laughs> no items. I'm just plagiarizing from the chat here. No items, no abilities, special physical split hadn't happened yet. It's a completely different world. It's a much simpler game. One that you can beat pretty much just by mashing A. There's no way you could do that with a modern game though. Those are way more complex. And we've been talking about Gen 1 for about 20 minutes now without really mentioning the third aspect that I think Gen 1 excels in. You can probably guess what it is. The glitches. <laughs> so when Gen 1 was developed, Game Freak was unironically a small indie studio. They were doing their best. They made some mistakes. <laughs> There's a couple errors in the programming of Pokemon Red and Blue that you can exploit to have a bit of fun. So the glitches in Gen 1 are pervasive. Pretty much every battle of the game, you're going to experience some sort of unintended mechanic. But I am going to defend this because the unintended mechanics, for the most part, like 95% of the time, simply mean that you deal slightly more damage and take slightly less damage than intended. <laughs> it really doesn't matter. All of the insane, like, game-breaking glitches like Missingno, uh, Glitch City, warping everywhere, teleporting through walls, almost all of those you have to do intentionally. Using very specific setups. That's why these were playground rumors, because you didn't just find these playing the game. Somebody had to do experimenting, discover the setup, and then share it around. The whole reason that you can even see this video is because I did the Green Glitches series, which involved trawling through the Japanese internet for specific glitches that were actually fixed in our release. So although these games are riddled with glitches, they really aren't that bad. It does not impact the experience unless you want them to, which I think is the important distinction between the glitches in Gen 1 and some of them that we'll be seeing in later entries of the series. You've never naturally talked to the drunk man, then flew to Cinnabar to swim along the edge of the island coast? So this is not a comprehensive list, but just a taste of some of the glitches that you'll probably encounter in your normal playthrough. 
Focus energy, instead of boosting your crit rate, actually reduces it to a quarter. That's not supposed to happen. The badge boost glitch is probably the one that'll affect your gameplay the most. All of the badges actually increase your stats by, I think, 12%. They're supposed to do that, but whenever your stats are modified, whether that positively or negatively through being boosted or lowered, the badge boosts are reapplied, and it's a multiplicative boost. So by altering your stats, your stats start to get crazy high, <laughs> and this allows you to overcome immense challenges using pathetic Pokemon like Pikachu. Ghost was supposed to be super effective against Psychic. Not only is it not super effective, Psychic is immune to it. I don't even know how this happened, but it did. Accuracy was not programmed correctly, and even if you had a 100% accurate move, there was a 1 in 256 chance that it would miss because they forgot the or equal to clause in their accuracy check. Fun fact about clauses, this red thing uh, is actually from a Santa Claus costume, but I, I cut the sleeves off. I don't know if it's a glitch, but some of the AI is programmed to be good, and what good means is that it always uses a super effective move, but it doesn't check if the move actually does any damage. So that's how you end up with the infamous uh, ATV versus Dragonite battle from Twitch Plays Pokemon, where Dragonite will just spam agility against Venomoth, because agility is a psychic move and it's super effective. There's the infamous Toxic Leech Seed combo. Toxic is a special version of Poison that increases in damage each time. Leech Seed, for some reason, also increments the Toxic counter and benefits from it. So if you apply Toxic and Leech Seed, according to the comment section of YouTube, it causes instant death, but what it actually does is cause death over three turns when usually another move causes death in one, so don't do it. But it is an interesting glitch. And Mew, nowadays we all know that it's in the game, but back in the day, it was the secret 151st Pokemon that maybe existed, maybe didn't. Maybe you could catch it, maybe you couldn't. You can catch it, using the Trainer Fly glitch, but we didn't know that back then. The Legend of Mew was probably another huge reason these games were so successful, because it was an impetus for you to go and talk about this cool new game to your friends, who would then pester their parents, throw the pester ball, and then buy the game, and then you could trade with them, maybe. Comment from X, Mew actually felt legendary. True, people told legends about it. So just to restate the, the three pillars that make Red and Blue great. Back in the day when they released, they were the game to play. Nowadays, they're still worth playing as like a historical gamer experience. And as a playground of glitches and jank, there's nothing like it. <laughs> Pokemon Yellow. This is the first time they released a definitive version, so sort of a remake within a generation. Uh, they invented color, wow, and then they added it to the game. And they also changed all of the front-facing sprites, made them a little better. The back sprites were not changed. Sorry, Venusaur. I actually just played this game 29 days ago. It is currently April 30th, so on April 1st, I played this game. I couldn't give my thoughts on it on the time. I actually couldn't give my thoughts on anything due to the circumstances of the stream. But having just played the game, I can say that... I was worried that the game might not hold up, but I think I can confirm that it does. It's still really fun to play. There's very minor changes between red and blue and yellow. Probably the biggest gameplay one is that instead of starting with your choice of either Bulbasaur, Charmander, or Squirtle, you are forced to start with Pikachu, and unlike in Let's Go Pikachu, where the Pikachu is buffed up and has special moves, Still a terrible Pokemon that you should replace, but it's at least better than a vanilla Pikachu. In yellow, you get a vanilla Pikachu. It's terrible. <laughs> and unless you talk to some shaman in Viridian Forest who empowers it with the other starters, you probably shouldn't use it. Good news is that you do actually get the three main starters throughout the story, because they sort of mix in some plot points from the anime. It's kind of a cute concept for a special version. In fact, they called it Special Pikachu Edition. That was the tagline. Overall, if you were to play a Gen 1 Kanto game, I would say just play yellow. 
I would say that it is the definitive version of Gen 1, almost as if it's the version they should have released in the first place. Hmm. Okay, and th there you can see the general opinions. Gen 1 nostalgia strong enough for A rank is crazy. Were you here for the full explanation? Pokemon Generation 2, Gold and Silver. I'm going to admit right now, I am wildly biased in favor of Johto. So my mother's side of the family, we're literally from Johto. It's not called Johto in real life, it's called the Kansai region. Uh, also sometimes called the Kinky region, which I mean it's not funny in Japanese. There is an organization called Kinky oh. Kids, which is really funny. <laughs> But we're from Osaka, which would be Goldenrod City, and I did a study abroad in Kyoto, which would be Ecritique City. So the first four generations are set in Kanto, Johto, Hoenn, and Sinnoh. But to me at least, Johto is the only generation that actually feels like it is set in Japan. For Kanto, if they didn't say it was in Kanto, you wouldn't know that. In fact, guide writers back in the day didn't know that. That's why they said it takes place on Pokemon Island. Which I guess is true, Japan is an island. Where would I place gold and silver? I'd say that they're definitely... The gold standard. Which the US no longer uses, since we are a free-floating fiat currency no longer tied to the value of gold. Thanks, Richard Nixon. <laughs> That's definitely why you're watching a Pokemon list, right? Unlike you American rubes who had to wait till the year 2000 to play this game, I actually got the game a couple months early in 1999 because my Japanese aunt sent it to me. Of course, I couldn't read anything. I had my mom <laughs> try and read stuff to me and I just ended up using whatever moves I thought looked the coolest. <laughs> Thankfully, Flamethrower looks really cool, so I just spammed that and beat the game. The Johto region to this day is the only game that features two regions, there is an expansive Kanto post game, uh, all thanks to Satoru Iwata. If you'll remember him, he's a legendary programmer, and apparently Game Freak Spaghetti Code was <laughs> real bad, and Satoru, he's got a better recipe, and he managed to compress the game such that they were able to fit in an entire new region. Pretty cool. And of course, Gold and Silver have perhaps the best super boss in gaming history? You! From the first game! There's a reason why Pokemon Masters Sex uh, tries to steal your money by luring you in with a trailer that shows the lead up to the red super boss battle. Actually, seeing that battle back in the day was crazy! It's me! Hey, I didn't use a Pikachu, maybe that's not me. And I'll also say that, I think that Gen 2 is probably the best that Pokemon has ever looked relative to other games that were also out. I think the Gen 2 aesthetic is nice and clean. Stuff actually looks correct. It's not like Gen 1 where you had to really imagine what things were supposed to look like. There was color. Stuff looked good for the time. It's also probably the biggest leap in quality programming wise between gens because most of the spaghetti has been removed for gen 2. Pretty much everything works except the great ball I think. Apparently almost every pokeball was buggy. Whoops. Dropped my balls. Apparently the gen 2 love ball. So love ball was supposed to only work on the opposite gender pokemon. But it did the opposite of that and only worked on the same gender Pokemon, so very progressive, but I don't think it's what they intended. <laughs> Alright, apparently there's a ton of Gen 2 glitches that weren't fixed. Gold glitches someday. <laughs> and there were two major mechanical changes. Special was split from one stat into two. Special used to be one stat, which just made specially inclined Pokemon incredibly busted. See most psychic types. <laughs> and they introduced held items, which have a major impact on the game. They also added steel types and dark types, and if there's anything I can say about steel types, it's that they're very fair and balanced, right? <laughs> so Gen 2 introduced shiny Pokemon. There's a 1 in, like, slightly less than 9,000 chance that a Pokemon will be a slightly different color. And I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that that mechanic alone has created careers for people. We can go on a shiny hunt right now. Ah, oh, that one's normal colored. The next one will be shiny, I think. Come on, how about this one? <gasps> Let's go! 
I don't like shiny hunting. <laughs> I'll put a disclaimer here that we're probably not going to mention every single mechanic that was introduced in every single game. I'm probably going to miss some, but hopefully if I forgot it, it wasn't that important. Anyway, Gen 2 also added breeding. Now, I've been singing Gen 2's praises, 55% chance that you're asleep, and the Gen 2 haters have been screeching in the chat, lowering my defense, and it's time to give them their due, because, yeah, Gen 2's got a lot of issues as well. <laughs> so some of the most notable things, Gen 2 Pokemon just suck. <laughs> A lot of them are just horrific and unusable. A lot of them are saved by later Gen 4 evolutions. Gen 2 Pokemon are so bad that almost every Johto leader's ace Pokemon is from Kanto. And a lot of the new Johto Pokemon are not even in Johto. Houndor is just chilling in the fields of Kanto? Like, where were you in Gen 1, bro? <laughs> like, what? And of course, the most cited, and I think fair criticism of Gen 2, is that the level curve is horrendous. It's kind of crazy that the entire game's level curve is destroyed by a fork in the road. <laughs> the level curve is pretty okay, up until you get to Ecritique City where you can go left or right, and either way you go, the rest of the game will no longer be a challenge. <laughs> Whoops. And also the Kanto post game, while it is neat that you can go to the entire Kanto region and see how things have changed, the ah. level curve there is just a total joke. You have to beat the Elite Four to even access Kanto, and yet the Kanto gym leaders are weaker than the Elite Four. Hello? And then after fighting like level 30, level 40 gym leaders, you suddenly fight Red, who's gonna kick your ass because he's like level 70. <laughs> What? There's also nothing to do in Kanto except bully these gym leaders, I guess. Pokemon Crystal. <laughs> Gen 2 introduced gender for both Pokemon and the players because you can finally actually play as a girl named Chris, I think for Crystal, and it's Chris with a K. If I had a nickel for every time you could choose an avatar in an RPG named Chris with a K, I'd have two nickels, which isn't a lot, but it is weird that that happened twice. All right, I was talking about Crystal and Fire Emblem 12, new mystery of the emblem, Heroes of Light and Shadow, but I think most people will assume I was talking about Deltarune. I've never played that. So what's actually new in Crystal? Not that much. So when you go to a new route, there's a little pop-up that shows you what route you're on. That's neat. One of the biggest changes is that they actually added animated sprites. It looks really good. Uh, when a Pokemon enters battle, they all have custom animations. Probably took the most time of the things they actually added. They added the very first battle tower at the time. It was kind of bare bones. There's just one or two circuits you can go through, no special challenges, but it was still neat. It was the first, and it would improve from then on, and it would be featured in, of course, every single game since. This was also the first game they sort of added a story about a legendary, so Suicune is on the cover, and they added a fancy water guy who likes Suicune. It might be this guy? I don't know, I mean, they all look the same to me. But the Suicune story is, like, six extra text boxes, it's not really anything new. But it's easier to catch Suicune in this game than just roaming around Johto, so there's that. Apparently Crystal had online play in Japan with like a special device, but I didn't actually live in Japan, so I didn't play Crystal online, and I also didn't get a Celebi. The Celebi event was JP exclusive. Story-wise, there still really isn't one, but you do have a rival, and I think maybe the most interesting rival in the series, he's the only one that's literally a criminal, <laughs> actually evil, and hates your guts. But he does experience character growth, because you fight him before the Elite Four, and he loses, and that's when he learns about friendship, and then when you fight him again in the post-game, his Golbat has evolved into a Crobat, which is a friendship evolution. Friendship always wins. Please bring back Jerk Rivals. Overall ranking for Crystal, if you're going to play a Gen 2 Johto game, assuming you don't like Mareep, because Mareep's not in the game unfortunately, I would just play Crystal. I'd say that this is the definitive version, uh, almost as if it's the version they should have released in the first place. And people do not like Crystal. Haters.
Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire released on March 19th, 2003. So this is actually very important to me because my birthday is March 18th. So this was actually my ninth birthday present and I did not leave my room for like two days. I think that uh, Ruby and Sapphire probably have the most hours I've actually spent playing the mainline story. I think we'll go ahead and place them first. I am going to put Ruby and Sapphire in B. I know, yeah, people are, people are putting arrows. <laughs> I knew it. Now, you can see in chat, pretty much everyone disagrees with me and thinks that these should be higher up. It's my list, okay? So what's new in Gen 3? Abilities were added. So every Pokemon just gets a, a bit of a boost, usually, although some abilities are negative, which is an interesting aspect about abilities. One of the first things I noticed when I played this game was that it doesn't have animated sprites. So I remember booting the game up, picking my Pokemon, and then seeing that it didn't move anymore. I thought this was the Game Boy Advance. Why did we go backwards? So why did I put Ruby and Sapphire in B? I'm not kidding when I say this. There's too much water. Like, I don't know why people criticize the IGN comment about 7.8 out of 10, too much water. I know that was about Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire. There's too much water. It's boring. <laughs> For me, the best part about the Pokemon games is exploring new areas and seeing what new Pokemon you're gonna encounter. For like a third of this game, I'll tell you what you're gonna encounter. Wingle and Tentacool. It's so boring. <laughs> I understand that's part of the region. It's supposed to be a water heavy region based on Kyushu, which has a lot of water. It's boring. <laughs> I'm sorry. Would your opinion change if you got access to dive and therefore other water Pokemon sooner? No. <laughs> what does dive allow you to access? Even more water. No thanks. Like, I'm definitely on Team Magma, okay? <laughs> Alright, Maxi's my homie. That's probably a way to segue into... This is the first game that really had a story? But I do think that Team Aqua's motivations are really undercut by the fact that there is so much water. Like, why would you ever join Team Aqua? Of course, there is a lot to like about Gen 3. They introduced double battles, which I think are really fun. Apparently doubles are the competitive format. I have no idea why. I guess because it's faster, but I don't like doubles. They're fun in game though. Gen 3 was the original deck set. This was the first time they cut off connectivity from the previous gens. And not every Pokemon was in Ruby and Sapphire, so you could not obtain them. Eventually, through linking with the other games introduced in Generation 3, you could obtain everything, but We'll talk more about that later, okay? This was sort of a sinister scheme. I won't hold that against Ruby and Sapphire. I will hold it against the other games. Regarding the Reggie quests, I guess you either like or hate them. So for the Reggie quests, they were super cryptic and you had to be able to read Braille. Perhaps you can see the problem with trying to read Braille. <laughs> Although I think they did include a code book like in the instruction manual so if you had a physical copy which was the only kind they had back then you could probably figure it out or you could maybe look it up on the as of yet nascent internet Oof. and your reward for completing the reggie quest were the reggies <laughs> incredible <laughs> shout out to ruby and sapphire for being the only game with your dad <laughs> i think most of the Dads in Pokemon are Fire Emblem dads, as in they're dead. Oh. <laughs> Ruby and Sapphire introduced Slugma, right? <laughs> Your Slugma grind set begins in Gen 3. Guys, I know Slugma's Gen 2. I should state this explicitly, YouTube don't ban me. I know Slugma is from Gen 2. The joke is that nobody knows that because you only find it in a grassy field to the west of Fuchsia City in Kanto of Gen 2. And of course, Slugma sucks, so you would never use it. Probably the first time most people encountered Slugma was in Gen 3 in Mount Chimney. And then you'd immediately forget it exists because it's Slugma. The music is definitely hit or miss. It, it is a meme that Hoenn is infinite trumpets. I'm a fan of it, but I think overall my favorite music would probably be from Gen 2. National Park is the best track in the entire series. Pokemon Emerald! I don't know how many takes I said would be hot at the beginning of this list, but this is probably gonna be one of them. 
Emerald, I think, is one of the most beloved games in the franchise. Here we go. <laughs> it's time for Iron Defense. <laughs> Maybe Cotton Guard, that's plus three, right? <laughs> oh, no, I'm not even gonna look at the chat. Oh, no. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> so one of my main criticisms of Ruby and Sapphire was that there's too much water. What did they do in Emerald? <laughs> they added more water! <laughs> you like water types? Well, here's another fancy water type guy, and he's the champion. I'm sick of this water! <laughs> ah! Of course, that's not the only change for Emerald. So in Emerald, they added back animated sprites? But they suck! <laughs> So in Crystal, every animated sprite was like custom animated. It looked great, probably took a lot of effort. If they're gonna sell you the same game again, maybe they should put in some effort, huh? In Emerald, they did it differently where it's just two poses and they added like squash and stretch. To me, even as a kid, I'm like, hey, they're cheating. They were just being lazy. They were. I think it looks way worse. It's not even comparable. So I do not consider the animated sprites to be much of an upside. Actual good changes that they did make in Emerald, because you'll see that, I mean, I, I did rank it higher, despite there being even more water. They retuned most of the gym leaders to make them a bit stronger. I think that overall makes the experience better. The storyline is different. You now fight both Team Aqua and Team Magma, and then... When Kyogre and Groudon start quarreling, Rayquaza comes down from the stratosphere with the steel chair uh, to tell them to cut it out. But these games are like 95% the same. Probably the best part of Emerald, certainly the most lauded part of it, is of course the Battle Frontier, which I do think is really great. Instead of just the one battle tower, you now have an entire frontier of possibilities. For people who have never experienced the Battle Frontier, it's several different unique challenge facilities. It's the ultimate post-game, where instead of holding your hand and helping you win every encounter, the game will actually just kick your ass and tell you to go EV train. <laughs> Lots of fun, unique challenges. I do really like the Battle Frontier. And I'm glad that it's been a mainstay of the series ever since. As a concession to the Gen 3 lobby, I won't change its position in the tier list, but I will admit there is another parallel universe not too far from this one where I put Emerald in A. But my personal experience with Emerald, surfing on endless waves, is that it's a B tier game. I'm sorry. There's too much water. Oh yeah, apparently this generation added contests. The fact that I'm mentioning it now probably tells you that I didn't really do contests. Oh, they also had secret bases, which I'm also mentioning now, so maybe I also didn't use those. I guess this list is not based. Oh, I f oh no. How could we forget the e-reader mechanics? We can forget them because they were worthless. Overall, I would say that if you're going to play a Gen 3 Hoenn game, I would play Emerald. I would say it's the definitive experience, uh, almost as if it's the one they should have released in the first place. Pokemon Fire Red and Leaf Green, released in 2004, so I was 10 years old. I have a personal very strong positive memory of this. On the day it came out, I went to the Pokemon yeah. Center in New York. <laughs> that used to be a thing before it became a Nintendo World. And I got the game like a little bit early. And then I went to a Pokemon trading card tournament in like Northern New Jersey. And I was the only one who had the game. So the other kids were freaking out like, how do you have a Charmander? Like it was crazy. Like I was the coolest kid at that tournament. I lost, but I won because I had the game early. C tier. I bet you didn't see that coming. Okay, literally everybody is saying that this should be higher. <laughs> this list is trash, wow. Very honest of you. This list is trubbish, wow. Wait till we get to Gen 4. Uh, fire Red and Leaf Green. This is the beginning of the Gen 3 Greed Syndicate. I don't know what we call this thing. 
Pokemon Generation 3. So there is a lot of behind the scenes machinations that I think made Gen 3 a lot worse than it had to be in the interest of making as much money as possible. So to begin with, Fire Red and Leaf Green is the worst version split they've ever done. They're literally the exact same, except that the Pokemon you can catch are different. They just wanted to sell you this the exact same game twice. I guess the title screen is different. Now that was also true for Red and Blue, but for Red and Blue, that was the first time they did it. And back then, you had to be in the same room to trade. I guess in this game, you also had to be in the same room to trade. There's a ton of boneheaded decisions in Fire Red and Leaf Green that exist solely to get you to buy other games. So Golbat just giga sucks. You cannot evolve into later evolutions until you finish the game. And you cannot do any trading with other games until you complete an incredibly lengthy and boring post-game fetch quest. Despite a lot of the improvements that have been made between Gens 1 and 3, the fact that they specifically restrict you from certain improvements just to sell you more games makes me so angry. It's pretty much a one-to-one -one remake of Red and Blue, but they did add the Sevi Islands, which Whoa. suck. They should remove them. They're annoying. Ah! Ah! If you really want to know about the darkness behind Generation 3, the YouTuber Tamahiro made an extensive documentary about the sinister dealings. I think if you watch that, you'll probably understand why I'm not such a big fan of these games. What I will say in credit of Gen 3, although it's not going to affect the rankings of these games, they're probably the best base for ROM hacks. A bunch of ROM hacks you'll see are based on Gen 3 because the engine is nice and snappy, and it's really easy to edit. I wonder if anybody got so mad at some of these placements that they just leave. <laughs> There's probably some people, right? View count went down like 15, so yeah. <laughs> Pokemon Coliseum and Coliseum XD. Arguably, these really shouldn't be on the list because they weren't even made by Game Freak. They were made by a studio called Genius Sonority. So here's the thing, YouTube removed dislikes, but not really. So the reason why they said they removed dislikes was to protect creators. You'll notice there is still a dislike button. You can press it, but you can't see how many dislikes there are. There is one person who can see how many dislikes there are. The creator. So they definitely protected our feelings by removing dislikes. Why am I mentioning this? Because my Pokemon Coliseum tier list is my most disliked video of all time. Can you guess why? Oh boy. Ah, <laughs> uh, I think Pokemon Coliseum is garbage. I said in the original Pokemon Coliseum stream that Pokemon Coliseum has a really good reputation based on people that I suspect have never actually played the game. And then literally like two days later, Tamahiro again released a video saying, po I think it was called Pokemon Coliseum, the worst Pokemon game you've never played. <laughs> I was vindicated, okay? Good Lord, this game is terrible. The only reason it is not in Game Freak's finest, I guess there's two reasons. One, Game Freak didn't make it. And two, it's really pretty. It does look really good and it's got some sick beats. But in terms of an actual game that you would play, Please don't. So back in the day when I played Fire Red and Leaf Green, I thought it was okay. I was like, oh yeah, this is fun. Nowadays, I'm like, wait, this game is so predatory. When I played Pokemon Coliseum back then, I was like, wait a minute. This game sucks. What? <laughs> this was the first Pokemon game that child cheese hated. Pokemon Coliseum is really easy to proselytize about because it has a really cool opening cutscene. And it has a really cool concept. The fact that you are a, a renegade team member who's on the edge, stealing shadow Pokemon. But then you actually play the game. The protagonist doesn't do anything after the first cutscene. He never says anything. And the actual gameplay of shadow Pokemon is horrendous. So as a quick rundown, the shadow Pokemon that you can catch, before you can actually use them properly, you have to purify them. 
and purifying them is just a relentless grind. We just send them out into battle and spam Shadow Rush over and over and over. And it goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway, Pokemon Colosseum has the worst roster of any Pokemon game ever. It is chock full of Johto's finest, and it didn't have to be that way. But it is that way because they want to sell you the game. You want Johto Pokemon in Gen 3? Buy a GameCube and pay $50 for Pokemon Coliseum. Ugh. There is cool stuff about the game. The fact that it is entirely doubles is a really interesting concept. Anything else I can say that's positive? <laughs> Part of the reason why I really dislike this game is because I do personally feel tricked by it. My question for you, why did they call this game Pokemon Coliseum? Yeah, there's Coliseums in the game, like, there's- the other games aren't called Pokemon Gym. <laughs> I thought this would be Pokemon Stadium 3 with a single-player adventure. And if that's what it was, I'd probably put it in A. I really liked Pokemon Stadium, I really liked Pokemon Stadium 2, and if there was just a lackluster side story tacked on, I'd probably be a lot more generous. But no, the side story is the entire story, and it is so bare-bones. It's set in a desert, well, the game definitely is a desert. It's also something I didn't really notice back in the day, but the way they treat your companion, uh, Rui, the girl who follows you and can detect shadow Pokemon, is really sexist. <laughs> so this game is 100% a power fantasy for edgy 11-year-old kids, which I was, and I still didn't like it. The fact that your female companion is replaced in the sequel by Google Glasses really shows you how much they cared about her. The difficulty in this game is decent at least. Oh boy. <laughs> Having just replayed Pokemon Coliseum, I can tell you, no. For the most part, you are fighting hilariously bad teams, like literally Sunkern and Hoppik. It's pathetic. I think people say it's difficult because the final boss rush has like a 20 level swing. It's ridiculous. <laughs> So the only thing you can do is go and grind. Terrible. Colosseum has a lot of difficulty spikes, which feels really clumsy, rather than having an actual difficulty curve. And the only way to overcome the spikes is to just grind or use rapid spin, I guess that defeats spikes. So what if there was a game that took Colosseum and removed most of the things that were bad about it, including the word Colosseum? You would get Pokemon XD, which I think is a major improvement in almost every way. I still don't know what XD means though. I think extra dimension. Maybe it's extra darkness. So what were the worst parts about Colosseum? It was super short, the Pokemon you could use were garbage, and purifying shadow Pokemon was incredibly tedious and annoying. What did they change in XD? Well, the game's a lot longer. There's way more Pokemon that aren't nearly as useless. And in terms of purifying shadow Pokemon, there's a new mechanic where you can do a little pipe matchup puzzle and purify Pokemon without actually having to use them in battle. So the best part about shadow Pokemon is not using them. <laughs> I really don't understand Cypher's plan because most shadow Pokemon are worse than their original counterparts, but at least shadow Pokemon have actual mechanics in XD. They don't just spam Shadow Rush. There's a whole different set of new shadow moves that are far more interesting. They're not good, but they're more interesting. I do think it's pretty funny that one of the most defining things about the original Colosseum, the fact that you had an edgy protagonist, is just immediately replaced. <laughs> You're just some kid in XD. <laughs> you lose your cool scooter, you have like a little moped, gets stuck in the sand. Sad. I think XD was where Bonsly debuted. So if you're a Bonsly fan, you probably like Pokemon XD. I don't like Bonsly. Channel veterans might know that I have a bit of beef with James Turner. He definitely doesn't even know who I am. <laughs> James Turner is one of the artists from Genius Sonority, the company that made uh, Coliseum XD and Battle Revolution. And I think he's responsible for Shadow Lugia. As in, like, it's, it's just a recolored Lugia. I mean, yeah, it looks cool. He also made some Pokemon that I don't really like. I think he's a fine artist. <laughs> I just don't like some of his designs. Pokemon Diamond and Pearl. Before we talk about Diamond and Pearl, I think we have to set the scene a bit by talking about how incredible technology is. 
So near the tail end of the Game Boy Advance's lifespan, you started having games that had full motion video. I remember that there was a Kingdom Hearts game that had a cutscene in like a field. And at the time, that was mind blowing, all right? Like you would willingly bind yourself to a chain of memories. And I, I, I bought this chain for a video. I'm not, I don't know if I'm gonna use it in the video, but I'm using it now. So just getting my value out of that. They also had these videos that you could buy on Game Boy Advance cartridges. I remember buying episodes of like the Hoenn League on a Game Boy Advance cartridge. They were like Nickelodeon shows. And at stunning like 70p, <laughs> you could see these horrible grainy videos on your Game Boy Advance. And at the time, that was crazy. That's where we were on the Game Boy Advance. You'll notice, of course, that Daipa are not for the Game Boy Advance. They're for the Nintendo DS. When the Nintendo DS came out, it was revolutionary. I remember the night the DS released, I was actually like physically running to Target <laughs> to buy one. And one of the release titles was Here Super Mario 64. So previously, this was a game you had to sit down at your TV to play. But now, in the future, you can play it on a handheld and it looks better. Of course, it plays a lot worse because you don't have an analog stick, but but it looked better and you could play it on the go. It was crazy. So we had 3D previously console games in the palm of your hand. Revolutionary. And then you have Pokemon Diamond and Pearl, which has 2D sprites that lag. You've got to be kidding me. I've got, I've got the band hammer ready, okay? Come at me. I have the power here, not you. I'll just sweet, go ahead. Put Tsuchino coin up. Come on, I wanna see your names. I would actually describe Diamond and Pearl as unplayable. Not purely for technical reasons, but largely for technical reasons. It is so slow. It really feels like you're just wading through molasses. I, I cannot believe how technically poor this game is. Now, back in the day, I didn't even know what a frame was. I just knew that as I was trying to play this game, I was 13, by the way, I'm like, wait, why is this so choppy? What's going on here? And that's just the technical performance. Let's actually talk about the game. It sucks. <laughs> What were they thinking? I think Diamond and Pearl has the most, like, boneheaded decisions. So you might know, I like fire types. There's only two. And yet they introduced a fire type Elite Four member who has more non-fire types? Why does the electric type gym leader have, like, an octillery? <laughs> what is going on? I think that excluding Coliseum, which is like a pseudo spin-off 600 BST, Daipa has the worst Pokedex of any like full-fledged mainline game. It is atrocious. There's like a bunch of useless water types. Everybody has the exact same team. Everybody uses Star Raptor because what else are you gonna do? Everybody uses Bidoof because Diamond and Pearl was the height of HM Hell. There were like eight HMs. Horrendous. Defog. Ugh. Rock climb, surfing at like five FPS. Ugh. Not everything's bad about Gen 4. Physical special split, one of the most impactful additions that they ever did. Start in Gen 4 and that was good. A chatter named Star Raptor Flock, unsurprisingly trying to advocate for Star Raptor. I do really like Star Raptor. In terms of technical reasons, what's worse than Diapa or Scarlet Violet? Scarlet Violet. Indisputably. It can't be disputed, something I will admit, that Generation 4 Sinnoh has the most relaxing music of any Pokemon game. If you go to any chill Pokemon music compilation, 
like 80% of it is from Sinnoh. <laughs> My advice to you, do not, under any circumstances, play Diamond and Pearl. You spend a third of the game wading through swamps, a third of the game wading through snow, and the rest of it wading through single-digit FPS. Horrendous. Last thing I'll say about Diamond and Pearl, I've probably already said Dipa a few times and you might be a little bit confused, maybe I should have explained this earlier. So in English we abbreviate uh, Diamond Pearl Platinum as DPP, but in Japanese they say Diamondo Pearl and they shorten it to Daipa. <gasps> and there is actually a segment of the Japanese fan base called Daipa Kids. <laughs> So Daipa is Diamond and Pearl, and Kids is literally the English word kids. This is to criticize people who started with Gen 4 and keep talking about how much they love Gen 4 and how great it is. The fact that Daipa sounds a lot like the English word for diaper is a pure coincidence, but it's really funny. <laughs> Cry some more, Daipa kids. Pokemon Platinum. One of the most beloved games in the series. People all over the internet will say, well, Dipa were horrible, but at least Platinum was good. Would I agree? Yeah, kind of. Come on! I can swing this all day! So Platinum fixes almost every issue in Diamond and Pearl, except the biggest one. It's a Sinnoh game. Sinnoh sucks, man. I just really don't like Sinnoh. But make no mistake, there are a lot of positive changes, as you can see by the massive disparity in their tiering. So Platinum fixes most of the technical aspects. Uh, it is a lot smoother. It's still a little bit slow, but not at the point where you feel like something's wrong. I'd say it feels relaxed. That might be tropium. One of the biggest changes was the Pokedex update. The thing is, they didn't really change that much. They only added about, I think, 60 Pokemon. It might be 59. But the bigger thing is that they retooled a lot of the team so that they actually make sense now. And they added the beloved Battle Frontier. It's back! They added the Distortion wow. World, which is... I mean, it's visually pretty cool. You get about 15 minutes of going up waterfalls. That's neat. Changes the order of some of the gyms. I think you fight Fantina earlier. Must be why it's a better game. Of all of these same-gen remakes, Platinum is definitely the biggest disparity. That's less a compliment towards Platinum and more an insult towards Dipa, which were blatantly unfinished. They felt like tech demos. If you're going to play a Gen 4 Sinnoh game, there is no reason to play Dipa. You should absolutely play Platinum. I would say that it's the definitive experience. Almost as if it's the game they should have released in the first place. 4444 donation from Zepia! Platinum Lobby checking in, Gen 4 goaded. I will not move it up, okay? But thank you. The Sinnoh games were the first games to actually have online connectivity through the Wi-Fi feature. The GTS was great, and it's been steadily getting worse, I think on purpose. We'll talk about that later. 4444 donation from Zepia, Platinum Lobby Rise Up. Thank you. I'm still not moving Platinum up. I will not bow, okay? Pokemon Heart Gold and Soul Silver. 55, 55 donation from T Dog Master. Black and White, Black and White 2 better be S tier. I actually have to go now, though, depending on how long this goes, I might catch the end. Thank you. I'll tell you that your wish may partially come true. You'll see. Pokemon Heart Gold and Soul Silver, HGSS. I hope your heater is on, because things are about to get really cold. I may have dropped some subtle hints about where this might go. Pretty much the coldest take in the entire Pokemon franchise. That Heart Gold and Soul Silver are the best Pokemon games of all time. Do you agree? You might not, but most people do. To me, the reason why I think Heart Gold and Soul Silver are the best are that they feel the most complete. When I play Heart Gold and Soul Silver, I never feel like anything's missing. I think there have been additions to the series that I would like to see. Like, you know, I, I do like the fairy type, I do like Megas, but I never feel like I'm missing something. It's got follower Pokemon, it's got two mostly full fledged reasons, and for me, at least, it has the best aesthetic. Of course, I have admitted I'm blatantly biased in favor of Johto. Johto is my favorite reason because of the personal connections I have to it. And to see it remastered on the DS, I think it's great. I, there is no game I would rather play in the Pokemon franchise than HGSS.
Most of the Johto garbage from Gen 2 actually has evolutions that you can access. Hooray! And they fixed the Kanto level curve. They didn't fix the Johto one though. Can't win everything. <laughs> $50 donation from Sean Jevons. Best remake, even better game. I agree. <laughs> Thanks for the donation. I think I would also describe HGSS as a lovingly crafted remake because while it does improve pretty much everything from the originals, it's still got a lot of wonderful nods towards the originals. There's the entire soundtrack switch. You can switch to all the classic music if you want. There's so many features. And of course, there's a full-fledged battle frontier and the Pokeathlon, which I didn't really like, but it's there. There's a bit of a meta aspect to my love for HGSS that I guess doesn't have to do with the game itself, but rather an accessory that came with it. So some of you may remember the Poke Walker, which is just a little pedometer that came with the game and it had very limited functionality, but you could send one of your Pokemon to the Poke Walker, walk around with it, it would gain a bit of XP, it would pick up items. And when the game came out in 2010, I was 16, and I used to deal a lot of damage with Heavy Slam, we'll put it that way. Really, I, w I was a gamer, okay? I didn't really leave my house. I just read book, play game. But suddenly, I was going around town, like actually running, because I wanted like 200 XP on Quilava. <laughs> and I think because of my exposure to the great outdoors through the Poke Walker, when I eventually got to college, I decided, hey, what if I was thin? <laughs> I started doing a bunch of exercise, and I think nowadays, I would say I do have a good attack stat. More than a decade later, because of this free accessory that came with Pokemon Heart Gold and Soul Silver, they would never do anything like this today. And I know they wouldn't, because you can buy the Pokemon Go Plus Plus for like $50. Now, of course, it is beefier than the Pokewalker was, but is it $50 beefier? I don't think so. They would never give you an accessory like this today. My Heavy Slam did get nerfed, but I take less damage from Low Kick. $50 donation from Zepia. <laughs> they could have ended the series at HGSS, it would have been fine in my opinion. It really does feel like the pinnacle of polish. I think pinnacle of polish is a good way to describe it. The only real flaw I would say it has is that the Johto level curve still has not been fixed. Important for balance, Slugma is still locked until post-game. Couldn't make the game too easy, could they? So people are saying to talk about the Pokeathlon. Pokeathlon's this really strange series of mini-games. Your Pokemon's species and stats kind of factor into it. It's very strange. I don't personally like it, but I think some people do. There is a full-fledged Battle Frontier that you can play through. If you're a fan of that, I'm really glad that the Battle Frontier, a staple of the series, has been included in every game since. Uh, HGSS is the last game that actually has a Battle Frontier, so savor it while you can. They also expanded the Safari Zone in HGSS. You can get a lot more Pokemon, but it's really annoying, so I'm not sure I would consider that an advantage. <laughs> Talk about the Sinjo Ruins and how Arceus showed an IRL photo of some freeway. All right, this is some trivia I don't know, but I guess in the premium, you might see an IRL photo of some freeway related to an Easter egg in HGSS. <laughs> Something that happened as the series progressed was that they removed gambling. In the originals, like Gen 1, you could straight up gamble money. There was a class called Gambler. They were rambling gambling dudes. And then in the remakes, they became r rambling gaming dudes, so it no longer rhymes, even though they could have been raging gaming guys, right? And there's just no more gambling. So gambling with imaginary money, inappropriate for kids. Gambling with real money in Pokemon Unite, appropriate for kids, apparently. Pokemon black and white. This world isn't so black and white. There's gray areas. I think Pokemon Black and White is incredibly overrated. Before you mail me poison powder and chop my head off with a leaf blade, I said they're overrated. I don't think they're bad. All right, I'm ready. I'm 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 in counter stance. Huh? Do I have to swing? I'm waiting. Okay, I think I'm okay. I don't have to swing this time. So Pokemon Black and White released in 2011. I was a junior in high school. I weighed about five pounds less thanks to the Pokewalker. 
So I was pretty much at the exact age to be a hater of black and white. Black and white had a lot of haters back in the day. I think for good reason. So the biggest reason people hated black and white was there was a Pokedex reset. They gave you the largest influx of new Pokemon ever. Pretty much a completely brand new 150 Pokedex. And that was all you had for the entire base game. And after you beat the base game, you could then access the old Pokemon. So there was a lot of pressure on the new Pokemon to be good. Because if they weren't, well, you couldn't even use your old Pokemon. Gen 5 introduced my least favorite Pokemon ever. And I want to talk about ice cream. Ice cream is great, but I stand, understand that for some of you, your favorite flavor is vanilla. James Turner <laughs> created the Vanillite line. I don't like vanilla, okay? Now people will say, well, if you hate Vanillite so much, why do you defend Grimer? It's literally sludge with eyes. I don't defend Grimer. Grimer's bad. But Vanillite is still worse, okay? <laughs> like, what? They can both be bad. We're, we're gonna bash Black and White a little bit more, not too much more. By far the most overrated part about Pokemon Black and White, you can probably predict what I'm gonna say, is the story. People will not stop gushing about how amazing the black and white story is. Your defense has been reduced, okay? I, I think that's like a Dota 2 skill gush. It's okay for a Pokemon game. Would you ever cite this as a work of great literature? No, it's all right. If you were 16 years old at the time, like I was, you would clearly see that Team Plasma is giga evil. I think that if Getsis <laughs> didn't turn into a Saturday morning cartoon villain at the end, I mean, it would probably be a better experience. I don't want to spoil the Elite Four twist, which I think is the best part of it. It definitely was a wow moment. But for someone like me, who does value story a whole lot, it's why I shill for Xenoblade Chronicles 1 so much. The black and white story is like, okay. It's good enough that I wouldn't say it makes the game worse. What an endorsement. <laughs> Last negative thing to say about black and white, it's something that's cited quite often because it's definitely true. The evolution levels are whack. <laughs> if a Pokemon evolves at some obscenely high level, you can probably bet that it was introduced in generation five. Now in gen five itself, that kind of works because the wild Pokemon themselves are actually really high level. So you would get Ponyard at like level 45 and in like five levels, it evolves. That feels fine. But then in later games, you get Ponyard at like level 12. It just sucks. <laughs> For like 40 levels. What I think they should just do is retcon the evolution levels. Just make them evolve earlier. Just do it. They've changed stats. I think they should just change evolution levels. I said last thing we're gonna say that's negative about black and white. I lied. Last thing we're gonna say that's negative about black and white. The <laughs> Entralink. <laughs> so hidden abilities were introduced in generation five. Hidden abilities are just abilities, but really annoying to get because you have to go through the dream world interface, which involves both your Wi-Fi connection and like your web browser and a Pokemon account. Entralink, I need you, Mio. What's my favorite part about playing Pokemon? It's not playing Pokemon while I'm asleep. It was literally called the dream world. Horrendous. I think it's literally inaccessible nowadays. Good riddance. I'm glad it's gone. <laughs> Horrible! Did you think growing berries in-game was exciting? Well, now you can do it in your web browser. No thanks. <laughs> We've been mercilessly dumping on this game that is at the top of A. So what's good about Generation 5? A lot. While there were some stinkers in the Pokedex, definitely Trubbish, literally stinky. A lot of Pokemon that I do like. And clearly, there was a ton of effort put into this game. It is the most alive the Pokemon have ever felt. They do this very interesting form of animation. I think every sprite is actually a bunch of different components and they're sort of puppeteered to give the illusion of motion. I don't think it always works. There's definitely some that look kinda janky, <laughs> but I think most of them do actually look quite good. Certainly better than the 3D that we would get in official mainline games later. People will say that black and white are linear because the root is kind of a circle. I don't quite think that's fair because along that path, there's a ton of branches and side quests that you can go and explore. It's a very beefy game with a very beefy post game. Somebody just said it, the sound design in black and white is fantastic. I agree. 
The aesthetic of the UI is also just really crisp. Everything works. You press a button, things happen, and it looks good. I think it's also overall one of the best balanced Pokemon games. The way they do XP is different than they do in other games. So in this game, if you're lower level than the opponent, you get way more XP. And if you're the same level or a higher level, you get way less. So it actually encourages you not to just juggernaut and crush the game with one Pokemon. You can still do that. I mean, if you pick Crocodiles. <laughs> <laughs> or Excadrill, yeah, you just crush the entire game. But it does encourage you to use a more balanced team through bonuses for using weaker Pokemon. The trainers also tend to be quite strong, at least compared to other games. I remember Elite Four Marshall kicked my butt, but that might have to do with the fact that fighting oh, yeah. was obscenely overpowered. I always thought that he ate too many blue raspberry candies, but apparently it's just a mouth guard and he doesn't actually have blue teeth. So shoutouts to having a vaguely tan person in a Pokemon game. They're very rare. The Innova region itself I'm also a big fan of because although I live in Kanto now and my family is from Johto, I grew up in Innova in New York. There is no desert next to us, but I, I think they just tried to kind of compress the American experience. One thing I don't like about black and white is that most of the water types are crap. Where were you during the black and white tier list where like a third of it was people telling me that Bastion was good? Pokemon black and white too. Before we talk about Black and White 2, I think we have to talk about sequels in general. So for movies, sequels tend to be worse. But for video games, sequels actually tend to be better. I think it has a lot to do with the developers getting more comfortable uh, with the engine and whatever assets they made for the game. And instead of focusing on like building the game, like from a technical level, they can focus more on building the world and the story with the assets they already made. Uh, you can see this with Pokemon Colosseum and XD. I, in very meek defense of Colosseum, they probably spent most of the time just building the engine and all the animations, which is why XD is so much more fleshed out, because they didn't have to do that. They just had to actually make the game part of it. So with Black and White 2, this is the only time that they've ever done full-blown sequels. It takes place in the Innova region with some recurring characters but the game is 90% different. Excellent game. I'm not gonna pick up the hammer because I don't think many people will disagree. The vast majority of the issues from Black and White were fixed. No pre-gen five Pokemon? Here they are. You like Growlithe? It's right here. It's yours. You like Magnemite? You can get in the zone. This game had voice acting. It's crazy. <laughs> if you go into Roxy's gym, in Japanese she sings about Dolgas, that's coughing. In English, she just sings about Pokemon. When you go to Elisa's gym, she asks if you're ready. I am ready to play one of the best Pokemon games ever. The story, I would say it's overall better than Black and White, but by like a little bit. I don't think either is great, but I think Colress is a really cool character. He's like a villain, but he's not like comic book evil. He just wants power, but not even for himself. He wants to discover power. Megas are coming next gen, hang in there. The Pokedex, I would agree, is really good. There's great variety in types, and it doesn't really feel like you have too few or too many options. I think that one of the great things about Black and White 2 is the fact that it's a sequel, so we're gonna ignite the Fire Emblem just for a little bit. I would say that Fire Emblem 9 and 10, those are the games Ike's in, you definitely know Ike. Individually, yeah, I like them but together they're my favorite. Just the fact that these are the characters you know and love. They're back with way more muscles and better stats. <laughs> Getting to see characters from previous games evolve. Wow, Pokemon terminology. It's just really satisfying to see. So like Charon, he was the arrival in the original game. And then in the sequel, he's a gym leader. He's actually the very first gym leader you face. And then knowing that he has this crazy powerful team from Black and White 1, but that he's grown as a character, and he's not just about crushing noobs, he's about training noobs and helping them improve. It's so nice. Fun game. Did you know that Pokemon Black and White 2 has a difficulty setting? It is the only Pokemon game in the entire series that actually has difficulty options. But of course, because it's a Pokemon game, it has to be the most convoluted, ridiculous crap ever. How do you unlock it? Is it a menu option? If only. So you can unlock easy mode by beating Pokemon White. I don't know why you would ever play easy mode after beating the game. So you can unlock hard mode by beating Pokemon Black. 
Now, I wish you could actually play the hard mode before playing the game, but I mean, there are games that lock hard mode behind completion. Final Fantasy VII Remake does that. I think that's fine. The issue is the key system. So when you beat Pokemon Black 2, you get a key that unlocks the challenge mode. But you beat the game already, and in Pokemon, you can only have one save file, right? So if you start a new game, you lose the key. Well, so how do you play the challenge mode? So you have to give the key to a separate copy of either Black 2 or White 2. Then you can delete your save file and send the key back, and then you can play challenge mode. What? And challenge mode itself has a lot of very strange choices. So in challenge mode, enemy trainers have more Pokemon. They have generally better movesets and a lot of them have held items. The Pokemon are also higher level, but they don't actually have higher stats. They have the same stats as their original levels, but I guess they deal slightly more damage and take slightly less damage just because level factors into the damage calculation. In some ways, it actually makes the game easier because of the way the experience formula works. Because you're now going to be lower level than the opponents, you gain more XP, so you're actually stronger. <laughs> Masuda, explain these choices, <laughs> what? $10 donation from Prometheus. The worst part about the key system, you need two copies of Black 2 to play challenge mode in Black 2. If you send the key to White 2, you cannot send that key back to Black 2. You can only send the easy key. Great system. I would say if you're going to play Black and White 2 nowadays, you should just play it uh, very legally on official hardware and uh, unlock challenge mode that way. I'm replaying Black and White 2 right now on challenge mode, and it is actually, I think, a really nice challenge for a Pokemon game. I'm almost always one or two levels below the gym leader. It feels really good. I'm trying to use about four Pokemon. Black and White 2 in-game tier list next, by the way. Other great stuff that's in Black and White 2, really fun side events. There's Pokestar Studios, which is one of the most bizarre, but in my opinion, also really fun side events. So you make Pokemon movies. I know that doesn't really mean anything. So what actually happens is you're basically put into pseudo scripted scenarios, 600 BST by the way. They're sort of challenge battles where you're given an objective to fulfill. In most Pokemon battles, the objective is the same kill the opponent as fast as possible. But in Pokestar Studios, you're actually trying to create an exciting tense scenario through the prompts they give you. So the prompt might be knock out an opponent each turn, or it might be something much wackier, like survive for X amount of turns. It's really interesting. And then at the end, the battle gets turned into a little video that you could watch with like special effects. It's really neat and charming. I love it. There was a character from Black and White called Bryce. He said he was an actor. You didn't really see it in Black and White, but in Black and White 2, you do, because he's an actor at Pokestar Studios. Yeah, somebody just said in the chat, each one is more of a puzzle than a battle, which I really like. It's one of the charms of the Battle Frontier as well. Pokestar Studios also has specific appeal to me, because before I became a professional YouTuber, please subscribe. I actually worked in the Japanese TV industry, so to actually see like a green screen in my Pokemon game is very strange because this is what I used to do in real life. I know how this works. And how can we forget the Pokemon World Tournament? It's sort of like a mini Battle Frontier. There's a bunch of mini Battle Frontiers in this game where you can eventually fight every gym leader that had appeared in the series up to that point in a tournament format. It was really cool. Is there negative stuff to say about Black and White 2 that we haven't yet? There's also the Battle Subway, which is okay, I guess. I mean, it's better than the Restaurant Subway, but that's not saying much. Ah. Fast food tier list when? Black and White 2 actually do have, for the first time, location differences. So Route 4 in White 2 is like a desolate ruin. But in Black 2, it's actually developed. It doesn't really change the gameplay that much, but it's kind of neat. At least it's an actual version difference. Another cool sequel thing, there's the memory link between Black and White and Black and White 2. Uh, and by importing save data, certain events will happen based on your progress through both games. Really neat. Sequel mechanics. Both Black and White 1 and Black and White 2 also have seasons. That's why they added Sawsbuck. I mean, it's no Go-Goat. 
But it is cool that, based on real-life timing, actual areas in the game change, and certain areas become accessible or inaccessible based on the season. It actually does affect gameplay, not a lot, but somewhat. It's neat. Shoutouts to Oracle of Ages and Oracle of Seasons, another game with season-based mechanics that have two versions that are actually different. It's crazy. They're completely different games. More stuff in favor of Gen 5 from Viper Snake. Rustling grass in Gen 5 so you can find some trade evolution Pokemon for the first time without trading. True. Quality of life. Uh, but there was... Platinum Steelix, that's true. A very strange thing that happens in Black and White 2. We'll talk about this more in the Black and White 2 tier list, but there's two... They're not quite event Pokemon, but there's an early Braviary and an early... They're extremely powerful because they're at a much lower level than they normally evolve. Almost as if those are the levels those Pokemon should evolve in the first place. Hmm. Oh, something I can't believe we said about Gen 5 yet? Infinite use TMs. If you're familiar with my general outlook on stuff, I'm a super try hard, grind till you die player. Like I play MMOs, okay? I play old school RuneScape. I will chop trees for weeks, okay? I have 93 wood cutting. I am not against grinding. I think that reusable TMs were fantastic. I love reusable TMs. It's one of the best changes they made. I think one of the arguments against it is that, oh, it makes the game too easy. But, like, you don't start with flamethrower. You start with like work up. <laughs> and when you finally get those super good TMs at the end of dungeons and like after hunting for them, it really does feel like a reward. You don't have to worry so much about who's gonna get your one earthquake TM. Everyone is quaking. I love reusable TMs, and I'm glad that it's been a series mainstay since. And people are saying that it's convenient. <laughs> I would definitely describe reusable TMs as convenient. I can't believe we forgot to mention this <laughs> throughout the entire black and white discussion. Gen 5 added triple battles and rotation battles, and I really love both. Triple battles are sort of the format that Yokai Watch uses. Yokai Watch, better franchise than Pokemon. I'll say it, please don't unsubscribe. <laughs> Really fun and fast-paced, and rotation battles are probably my f favorite form of Pokemon battles, because they're like single battles, except switching doesn't take a turn. I love it. It's really strategic. And people tell me like, oh, it's just luck-based. It's not luck-based. You should figure out what your opponent's doing using your brain. Maybe your brain's too small. <laughs> Evil streamer ridicules the audience. And of course, these formats were removed in later generations for technical reasons, because they can barely do doubles, so how can you manage triples? We'll also say that, despite the fact that Black and White and Black and White 2 are in like 2.5D, it's probably the most alive world they've ever made. You can kind of see how they tried to recreate Castelia City in Scarlet and Violet, because in Castelia City, you have people running past you, and then just text pops up. And now this text isn't from individual people, right? It's snippets of conversations you're hearing from the people running by, so it makes sense, right? You can abstract what's happening. And then in Scarlet and Violet, one dude is walking around saying, that's right, to nobody. It just looks terrible. <laughs> they also toned down HM use a lot, not quite eliminated, but compared to HM hell of Gen 4, where you had to have at least two HM employees on your payroll. Not even HGSS was exempt from that. Black and White really toned down HM. I think you just needed cut and then the rest, well, and like Surf, but Surf is actually good. And the rest were like optional to just get like treasures. It wasn't that bad. There was no Mount Coronet, I'll say that. So overall, Black and White 2 were a fantastic addition to the series. I really love that they did full blown sequels. Uh, the sequel even retroactively makes black and white one better because playing black and white one makes two better oh black and white two were fantastic a high point for the series and nobody bought them so we're never getting sequels again you did this you're the reason why pokemon's bad ah! so pokemon x and y came out in 2013 i was a sophomore in college Usually, and I agree with this, Pokemon X and Y, the jump to 3D, is the line of demarcation between old Pokemon and new Pokemon. X and Y is where Pokemon finally made the leap to 3D, and some would argue this was where the downfall began. Pokemon X and Y. Old game's good. New game's bad. Ah! 
I like them. I thought they were fine. And not just because Charizard got two Megas, okay? I think people nowadays will advocate for Pokemon to go back to 2D or to do the like 2.5D style of like Octopath Traveler. Now this is a pretty hot take and I, I can definitely say that I might be wrong on this, but I personally, me, imported cheese, Omar, I do not like the style of Octopath Traveler. I don't, I much prefer 3D. The issue is not 3D, 3D is the future. The issue is that Game Freak sucks at 3D. <laughs> We know that 3D is better because Colosseum had 3D and it's the only reason why anybody defends those games. The issue isn't 3D, the issue is bad 3D. For me, playing X and Y was probably the moment I was supposed to have playing Super Mario 64 on the DS. To finally have Pokemon battling each other in 3D in the palm of my hand. Wow, this was the future and surely it can only go up from here, right? I think Megas were a fantastic addition. I know not everybody likes Megas. Obviously, as somebody who likes Charizard, I'm gonna be more of a fan of Megas than most, but I, I did think they were a fun way to really revitalize old Pokemon. It's the best gimmick they've ever done. And of course, at the time, we didn't know it was a gimmick because we didn't know they were gonna remove them. But can you think of another way to take Beedrill and make it not only usable, but somewhat viable? There was nothing they could have done other than a mega tier rework to actually get that garbage to work. Of course, in terms of in-game balance, it's a disaster, right? <laughs> the only reason you wouldn't mega and crush the entire game is because watching the animation is annoying. Five donation from Blue Crimson 217. XY is, did you like Kanto in 3D? Gen 6 starters should have had megas. I guess Gen 5 is kind of where the Kanto pandering started because a lot of the Gen 5 Pokedex echoes Gen 1. Final Mecha is a good game, by the way. But Gen 6 is definitely where they started the sleeper agent programming. Hey, you get the Gen 1 starters. You like Gen 1, right? Yes. I love Gen 1. I picked Charmander. I thought the Kalos region was... okay? I mean, I, I'm not from France, so I don't know if it actually feels French, but... it feels okay? Story was kinda weird. I'm really not sure why Lysander's ace is Mega Gyarados, given that he looks like a Pyroar, but something probably got mixed up in development, I would guess. Shoutouts to Gen 6 for being the first generation where you could actually make competitive Pokemon without just cheating. It was still kind of annoying to do, but you could theoretically do it without wasting your entire life, which was nice. I will also say, reiterating that I am a super try-hard, grind-till-you-die, 93 wood-cutting MMO gamer, I think that party-wide XP share is good. It's not a question of easy, Mon. Almost every RPG has party-wide experience share. Party members that don't fight get experience. That's fine. The issue is that the game is not balanced around it at all. If you have party-wide experience share on the entire time, you're just gonna crush the entire game. The fact that you can turn it off when you're getting too strong in order to like, hold back your true power is what makes experience share work. I wish they had kept it that way. $2 donation from Mi Mitizuoki. After our customization began in this generation? Uh, yes, you're right. This was the first generation where you could equip the drip, because I guess most people in France do that. If you're French, let me know how much you drip. Uh, that's, ooh. I might have said this before in a different video, but I'll say it now. I think it's a good thing that Pokemon games are easy. I recognize that these are games for children. It should be possible to clear it while making quite a few mistakes. I just wish there were more ways to modulate the difficulty and make it more difficult for 29 year olds like me. Xenoblade system of extra XP and D-loving to tell your experience should be industry standard. I agree. For those who don't know, uh, in Xenoblade, which is an RPG, when you complete quests, you get bonus XP, which you can choose to then cash in. So one of the issues with a lot of RPGs is that you like deliver groceries for grandma and suddenly like one shot the god of the world because you have you're like way over leveled. But in Xenoblade, you can choose to just not get the XP until you actually want it. And you can also reduce your level whenever you want and then re-level yourself using that XP whenever you want. So you can challenge yourself when you want to and steamroll when you want to. It's great. Please play Xenoblade, but maybe not Xenoblade 2. X and Y introduced horde battles, which 
I don't know if I really like them, but it's a fast way to EV train, I guess. <laughs> For the Horde! <laughs> there were also inverse battles, which is... I, I wish they appeared later in an inverse battle. It was just this one dude in like a hut who used his psychic powers to invert the type chart. So suddenly steel types are just garbage <laughs> and normal types are pummeling everyone. It's, it's a neat experience. I'm not sure it would really work on a wider scale, but it's cool that they at least tried that. There were also sky battles, which were just battles, but you had to use flying types or levitators and they ruined all of the animation of flying Pokemon to make sky battles work. It's the reason why a lot of flying type Pokemon just kind of hover. Is this how you fly? I don't think so. Shoutouts to Gen 6 Online. I, I think we can all agree that Gen 6 Online was the best it's ever been. The player search system was so simple and clean. Please don't copyright claim me. Are there people near you? Here they are. You can also access the O powers for minor buffs to a bunch of different aspects of the game. You wanna fight someone? Tap them on the PSS. You wanna search for someone? Use the player search system. It did exactly what you wanted to, without any weird barriers. And I don't think it's an accident that the system got worse. The worst part about X and Y is that it's clearly unfinished, but you probably wouldn't realize that until you actually get to the post game, because there is no post game. Also, F's for Zygarde, he's still in that cave. Somebody go get him. It's been over a decade. He's lonely. I don't think we mentioned fairy types. Gen 6 added fairy types. Oh no. <laughs> They're really overpowered. Make fairies weak to bug? I agree. Justice for bugs. Here's my hot take. Make fairy weak to normal. Oh. 199 donation from Jacob. Only three <laughs> mons per gym because it's in 3D. <laughs> Pokemon Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire. People really hate on this remake. Somebody literally typed a message slandering this. Pokemon Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, I think are just better than Ruby and Sapphire. I don't know why you would ever play Ruby and Sapphire when you could play Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire. I think they're a straight upgrade in almost every way. It's the same game you know and maybe don't love that much. It's in B tier, <laughs> but just better. All of the quality of life updates from subsequent generations have been added. Infinite use TMs, less annoying HMs. You get some soaring. It's in 3D. There's Megas. You can fight Wally. He's got a cool necklace and a Chad Glade. Physical special split, fairy typing, Dex Nav, PSS, online functionality. Mega Swampert! I think that Dean OOR93 might be a little biased. <laughs> I think so far this is the most people have actually agreed with me. <laughs> I think this was the game that the infamous 7.8 out of 10 Too Much Water review was actually about. <laughs> Soaring was fun for about 5 seconds, I agree, it is a bit annoying. But at least they tried something, and I don't think it was that bad. So for me, Omega Ruby Alpha Sapphire was the first Pokemon game I actually played in Japanese. I was practicing. I played it while I was doing my study abroad in Ecruteak City in real life, known as Kyoto. And I remember I went to a Pokemon club meeting, the Pokemon fan club. Nobody talked about Rapidash. I fought a guy whose name was Dedededededededededede, and he had six Dedene. I won. And then pretty much everybody there, because Japan has different rule sets, everybody had Garchomp. And I didn't because Garchomp was banned, so I got my ass kicked. And then one guy came up to me. I guess he was trying to practice his English because he said to me in English, Ratiasu is my waifu. And then I left. Don't call me a Pokemon fan. I don't want to associate with these degenerates. <laughs> Maybe he meant the human Latias from the movie. Delta episode puts it over Emerald. We do have to talk about the reason why it is not going above Emerald, which is one of the most blatant uh, double slaps in the face that they've ever done. Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire take place in like a parallel dimension where Megas exist, and then they removed the battle frontier, but not entirely. You can go to the site of the battle frontier, and there's a sign that says, the battle frontier project has started. It's like when you leave a tip for one cent. It's more insulting than if they had had nothing at all. I think Masuda literally said that the reason why they don't do the Battle Frontier is because kids these days just play mobile games and they have short attention spans. So TikTok really did ruin everything. Give me the Battle Frontier. 
I think if the Battle Frontier was in the game, nobody would have any qualms about putting it above Emerald. Another thing that is a strike against Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire is that Emerald exists, right? You have a unified storyline that everybody would agree is more engaging than the separate storylines, but they didn't remake Emerald because that way they wouldn't be able to sell you two games. That's kind of scummy. Could you imagine doing a remake and not remaking the premium version? It's kind of weird, right? Pokemon Sun and Moon, Generation 7, the Alola region, released in 2016. So this was actually my first year in Japan. I had just graduated from college and I moved to Japan and I decided to play some Pokemon as I always had been doing. Generation 7 is much maligned. People really seem to hate this generation. Do I? The sun isn't exactly shining bright. Ironically, even though it's set on a chain of islands, there's less water than Owens. <laughs> Alola, also known as Aslola, for some reason all the Pokemon they added are super slow. I think one of the biggest issues with this game that probably drags it to the bottom of C and arguably puts it in D is the atrocious tutorial. This is the game where infinite handholding started. The tutorial is like two hours long and it never actually ends. You get slightly more freedom, but it's like you're in the supermarket and your mom has you on a leash. You, you can go a little bit away, but she's gonna yank that leash soon. I will never play these games again just because the opening tutorial is so agonizing. The actual game itself is mostly okay. I would say that the greatest strike against it is that it's clearly unfinished. But unlike X and Y, where you didn't really notice till the end, with Sun and Moon, you notice about two thirds of the way through. What happened to the last third of the game? You go to the Elite Four and then there's this like golfer chick? Who are you? I think she was supposed to appear in the golf resort, which is in the game, but like isn't finished. May as well talk about the gyms and the island trial. You notice I called them gyms, even though they're not actually gyms, they're island trials, they're gyms. They boasted about having uh, unique trials instead of gyms, they're just gyms. But at least the trials themselves are kind of fun. I really like the Fatal Frame Mimikyu one. Mimikyu is one of the best Pokemon they've ever added, I love it. In terms of technical performance, they tried adding more stuff to the screen at once, like the trainers now stand on the field. They, they probably should have tried harder because the game really starts to chug. <laughs> And that's where they decided uh, triple and rotation battles were gonna get cut. I guess the third participant on the field is the trainer. And of course, I hope you like Kanto because the concept of regional evolutions were introduced or regional variants. I think regional variants are cool and a good addition. I hope you like Gen 1. <laughs> Here's your Gen 1 variants. Yes, I love Gen 1. I picked Squirtle. It was my favorite starter. The story was all right. It had some cool moments. I'd say that overall, Black and White was better, and as we already stated, I wasn't that much of a fan of the Black and White story. The Jellyfish Lusamine was cool. I think she placed really highly on the waifu tier list. Surprise. Guzma is also hilarious. I, I think it's probably safe to say that the villainous team in Gen 7 was the best, because they were just a bunch of ruffians. Definitely my favorite moment in Gen 7 is after you beat the game, there's a post-game battle with Guzma where he's just at his mom's house in normal clothes. It's hilarious. It's your boy Guzma. Shoutouts to some guy, Miguel from my Discord. Galissapod oh. is his favorite Pokemon. He really likes Galissapod and he really likes Guzma. He made an entire Gen 5 hack called Project Bug. I don't think he's in the chat now, but I'll ask him if I can put a link to it in the description. If, if you like bugs and you like Gen 5, Maybe consider trying that game out. I think he spent a lot of time on it. I did like what they tried to do with the Elite Four, where you become the very first champion ever, and then after you become the champion, there is title defense, where some trainers will come and fight you, including like the super youngster. <laughs> we do have to mention the Festival Plaza Glow Down. What's the opposite of glow up? Dim Down? I'm Doug Dimmodome. <laughs> The Festival Plaza was just the PSS, but with extra steps. You had to go to some bizarro pocket dimension where everyone was like creepily happy. It was an endless festival or else you better smile. I don't know why they 
made it so much worse. I mean, I do know why they made it worse. We'll talk more about that later. I think this is the third time I've said that. One of the best parts about Gen 7, HMs are dead. <laughs> they're gone. I've never liked HMs. I don't think anybody has. And they're finally gone and replaced in, I think, the perfect way. The whole point about HMs was that your Pokemon were helping you navigate the world. And I think that the companion Pokemon, what are they called? The Pokemon call system? The ride Pokemon system was the perfect solution because you still have Pokemon helping you through the world without all of the inconvenience of having to actually have your move slots taken up by these garbage useless moves. And of course, ride Pokemon were then replaced by a bike because I guess it was just too much work. No convenience in this franchise. Oh yeah, I guess the battle tree you can find red and blue, and red is like old. But I guess younger than I am now in this red costume, that's kind of weird to think about. Oh yeah! <laughs> we got through the entire description of Sun and Moon without mentioning Z-moves! <laughs> so the major gimmick of Gen 7 are Z-moves? Really tells you how much I like Z-moves, I totally forgot they existed. So you could equip a Z-Crystal and then use one move a battle and watch a really annoying cutscene that was terribly animated. No thanks. Good riddance. Bring back Megas. There were some Z-Moves that I think were really cool. Notably the ones that weren't just do a bunch of damage. Z-Splash is great. Don't forget that you can use Z-Last Resort. The 9 EVO boost. <laughs> I keep forgetting these major mechanics. This, this game also has Ultra Beasts. Which, on the one hand, I don't really like because they don't look like Pokemon to me, but also, that's kind of the point, right? They're supposed to be very strange, so I guess that's acceptable. I just wasn't a huge fan. Moon had a reversed day and night cycle, which was very strange. I assume the reason why they did this was because they expected most people to play during the day, and that way you'd get night-specific events if you played Moon. I don't really know why they did that. Does anybody know? <laughs> I forgot about Zygarde just like Game Freak. Honestly, I know so little about Zygarde in Sun and Moon that I, I can't even say more about it now. I guess it's in Sun and Moon. That's what somebody in chat says. I've never seen it. Apparently Zygarde is a collectathon quest in Sun and Moon. I guess I didn't collect them all because I totally forgot about them. Last thing I'll say about Sun and Moon, for me, this was the first game where I started to notice that something was really wrong. From a source you might not expect. So Sun and Moon has all of the Pokemon in it. You can import Pokemon that aren't in the regional decks. They have all their stats. They have all their moves. They're fully functional, but their Pokedex entry is completely empty. Now Pokedex text is something they've been copy pasting for generations. I don't care about that. But I remember thinking, well, why don't these Pokemon have Pokedex entries. Surely that couldn't have been too hard to add, right? It's literally two or three lines of text for each Pokemon. What happened? I mean, maybe it was just, it's just a blip, right? A glitch in the matrix? This isn't a portent of things to come, right? Pokemon Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon. It's got Ultra in the title. And Ultra implies better, right? <coughs> now let me be clear. Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon might be, arguably, a little bit better than Sun and Moon. I think these games are so disgustingly greedy that I am putting them in F. I can't believe they did this. Biggest scam in the franchise, which is really saying something. We're talking about Pokemon here. I cannot believe they resold you the same game twice one year later for about, I'm not even exaggerating here, 20 minutes of extra content. Absolutely disgusting. What? <laughs> now there's probably more than 20 minutes of new stuff, but they also took things out. Squishy jellyfish waifu Lusamine, gone. Hope you like Ultra Necrozma. I don't. They upgraded the Rotom Dex. Rotom Dex is one of the most annoying parts of Sun and Moon. He never shuts up. Get ready for Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon Rotom Dex. Leave me alone. Ah! <laughs> so the actual changes that they implemented in Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon, there's barely any. So they reshuffled some story events, removed some story events, including the Lusamine Jellyfish fight, and they added Ultra Hallway featuring Ultra Necrozma. 
That's it. Also, Lily, her story gets gutted. The main story of Sun and Moon, which some people liked, I thought it was okay, it was about Lily's growth. She never grows, even though they buffed the move growth to be strictly better than workup. Well, not in Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon. The end of her story is just gone. She doesn't get to go to Kanto, where all the cool trainers are, apparently. Gladion goes instead? Like, what? They added the Rainbow Rocket story after the game. I would pay maybe $2 to experience that. But you're gonna have to pay full price for the same game! And they added more tedium. They added two minigames, Mantine Surf and another minigame that I definitely don't like, otherwise I probably would've remembered it. And they're mandatory at least once. Ah, uh, it's the Ultra Space, the wormhole thing, yeah. It's quite a feat to do a remake, make it this shamelessly greedy, and make it worse. This is probably the most indefensible game in the franchise. The only reason it's not gonna be at the absolute bottom is because at its core, it's still Gen 7, which is okay. Do we talk about Battle Royale? I think somebody mentioned it. Battle Royale is, I think it's like a 4v4 format? Uh, 4 FPS format. 1v1v1v1. Commander? I choose Tyranitar as my commander. His ability Sandstream reduces the frame rate of other opponents. <laughs> Anything else to say about Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon? Ultra Sun, more like Ultra Scam! Can I say that, like, legally? And so begins the Switch era of Pokemon. Get ready. Pokemon, let's go Eevee, and let's go Pikachu. Nobody says in that order. Pokemon, let's go Pikachu, and let's go Eevee. I think you're going to be really surprised. I'm being very generous here, because I recognize that Let's Go Eevee and Let's Go Pikachu are not for me. They are very explicitly not for me. They are laser focused at the Pokemon Go crowd. I would call them mobile gamers. I shudder to even use the word gamer to describe that filth. These games are specifically meant to activate the sleeper agent programming from Gen 1. Hey, have you heard about Pokemon Go? Yes. I liked Eevee. I always evolved it into Jolteon. I should play this game. We'll start with the good stuff. It looks good for a Pokemon game. It's definitely the best looking Pokemon game on the Switch, for sure. The environments look good, and I think, indisputably, the best follower Pokemon ever. The follower Pokemon are amazing. They all have so much personality. You can ride on Onyx! He's rock hard! You can ride on Charizard! You can ride on Rhydon! You can ride on Lapras! You've got S-tier waifu Lorelei, the glow up from the original red and blue like melting sprite to like super milf librarian. It's great. <laughs> The actual gameplay is not for me. I hate the let's go catching mechanics, and they pared down a lot of the main game mechanics. I know, they made it even easier, crazy, but there's no held items, there's no abilities, and because of the candy system, you can just stuff whatever Pokemon you want with a bunch of sugar and just make them invincible. And I really do mean invincible. Like, your stats can get so much higher than enemies that I don't really know how you can lose. The game really oh. is pretty much unlosable, because you, they won't even let you enter gyms unless you fulfill criteria that makes the gym unlosable, pretty much. This is probably the one game that I personally like, don't like that I might still recommend to you. Like, if you like Pokemon Go, I mean, you probably like Let's Go. Your starters get a lot of personality, and at least they actually buff up your starters. So Starter Pikachu and Starter Eevee are far stronger than vanilla Pikachu and Eevee. They're still terrible, because <laughs> they can't evolve, but they're not like a total joke. You can use them, and the game is so easy. You may as well, if you're a Pikachu or Eevee fan. Last thing I'll say about Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee, I guess it's a positive thing, is that it does work. I don't mean work as in like it's a fun and engaging experience. I mean that nothing like breaks technically. You can play it and things will happen as intended. That's pretty cool, right? I hate the cutesy names they give the moves. You don't like Zing Zap? That might not be it. You don't like Zappy Zip? I have no idea what it's called. <laughs> There's an electric priority move. You don't like Salad Spinner? I have no idea what these moves are called. You don't like Swirly Swirl? I think that was a real one. Zippy Zap. Zippy Zap. Sizzly Slide? Uh. 
I mean, guys, maybe you don't know this. I think this is a game for children. <laughs> Wait, is Baddy Bad actually one of the moves? I thought that was a joke. Did they have better Japanese names for the moves, or are they still bad? I assume they're still really cutesy. Let's look that up right now, because we actually have a lot of extra time, right? We've only been going for four and a half hours. Baddy Bad. Waru Waru Zone. <laughs> it's literally called Bad Bad Zone, yeah. Wow, Baddy Bad. Oh, would we use Baddy Bad to describe any games in the franchise? Mm. Well, welcome to the Bad Bad Zone. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Should we just rename this to the Bad Bad Zone? <laughs> Signature move. Pokemon Sword and Shield. Oh boy. So throughout this stream, I've had to keep resetting the music. And when I do that, in the sidebar, you might no you might have noticed, I'm getting suggestions for a video from a creator called The Mad Season Show. Maybe you know who he is, maybe you don't. I really like Mad Season Show. He's a creator who used to do uh, World of Warcraft content, but <laughs> World of Warcraft has also had some issues. <laughs> So now he just does general video essay stuff. It's all really good. You should definitely check him out. I'm mentioning him because he said, I don't know how much he was joking. He said that Warlords of Draenor was his favorite World of Warcraft expansion because it was so bad that he got bored and started a YouTube channel. For me, Sword and Shield, it's the Warlords of Galar. This is a game that I played, and I just stopped in my tracks. I was like, what am I doing with my life? Am I really a Pokemon fan? <laughs> what is going on? For those who don't know about Warlords of Draenor, it's a World of Warcraft expansion that pretty much everyone agrees was really, really bad and unfinished. Ooh, that might be relevant. Warlords of Draenor was probably better than Sword and Shield. Oh, absolutely. No question, but not a, not a candidate for this list. Sword and Shield was supposed to be such a triumph. Like, this was what we were waiting for. Here's the Pokemon game that is finally on a home console. I think I'd rather go to Britain in real life. Oh, I have been to Britain in real life. It's actually nice. I'm sorry. It's impossible to talk about Sword and Shield without talking about Dexit, which I guess also relates to Great Britain. So the huge controversy about Sword and Shield, this was the first time that not every Pokemon would be in the game. Now, of course, the other games never had all the Pokemon available in the regional decks, but once you cleared the game, you could trade in whatever Pokemon you actually wanted to use. And here, Masta decided not every Pokemon is going to make it into the game. And the reason they cited for this was high quality animations. Now, let me be clear. I don't actually have a problem with Dexit. I think it was kind of an inevitability that eventually not every Pokemon would be able to make it into the game. The issue is that the Pokemon aren't in the game oh. and the game sucks. <laughs> That's the issue. If we actually got high quality animations, I don't think anybody would care. Okay, is there anything good we can say about Sword and Shield? I'm struggling to think of anything. I guess I'm out of PP. Like, I'm really thinking here. I can't think of anything. I really can't think of anything. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, raids are kind of fun. I'm going to take your mod status away. Wooloo's cute, I guess. They gave us mints. Okay, mints, mints, mints is something. Oh, move tutors, yes, okay. Th that is one positive thing. I liked free move relearning. I think free move relearning was a good quality of life change. We got, we got, we got one thing, yeah. <laughs> These games are a disaster. So we'll start with the obvious stuff. This game looks terrible. Like for a Switch game, the fact that you can't really tell it's not just an upscaled 3DS game is a problem. Of course, I think it is an upscaled 3DS game. I believe they thought the Switch would flop so they initially intended this for this to be a 3DS game. I'm not sure if that's confirmed, but it definitely seems to be the case. It literally looks that way. The performance is absolute garbage. Like, the way that Pokemon pop up out of nowhere, it looks terrible. It makes it really easy to edit memes about it, because you can just do a very basic function in Premiere to recreate the effect. All right, Torchic, our adventure begins. <laughs> 
They should have gotten the people that made Pokemon XD back. There were good Pokemon models animation on the GameCube, but they couldn't do it again on the Switch. They ripped a lot of the models in the Coliseum games from just Pokemon Stadium. HAL Laboratories are the true heroes. They have been the entire time. I guess I'll also do it now because I didn't talk about Pokemon Battle Revolution before, but Pokemon Battle Revolution is an atrocious game. People just praise it now because it's still the best that Pokemon has ever looked. That's not a good thing. That's a bad thing. <laughs> so Sword and Shield, we gotta talk more about this thing. Performance issues aside, do we get a good game? No. They call it Sword and Shield because you either attack or defend it. Well, guess which side I'm on. I should get my sword for this. Ah! I don't like this game. Bad changes that were made in Sword and Shield, for whatever reason, the toggleable XP share, which as we established before was an excellent feature, can no longer be toggled. So they had functionality and they removed it. Why? <laughs> why? There's actually a statement about why, which is the whole reason why we did the Omori's challenge. Director Omori literally said in an interview, if you don't want your Pokemon to get over leveled, you can just box the Pokemon you don't want to use. What? I guess another positive change they made was the box link. I do like that you can access your box from anywhere. That's nice. Dynamax. It's the main gimmick of the generation. It sucks. So one of the complaints about Mega Evolutions was that they were limited to certain Pokemon. So if you're a Charizard fan like me, obviously you're gonna like Megas. But what if you like, I don't know, Quagsire? Is Quagsire even in Sword and Shield? <laughs> okay, he is. Alright, so what if you like Quagsire? Well, now you can use Quagsire, but big. It is the laziest mechanic. You literally just scale the model up, and they sort of mashed in Z-moves, but just the worst part of Z-moves. Every single typed move just becomes a big nuke with, like, some effect. It is not anywhere near balanced. Max Airstream is completely busted. The fire move is really busted. I think maybe the worst part about Dynamax is that the best part of Z-moves was all of the status moves because they all had really unique and zany effects. Every single non-attacking Dynamax move is just big protect. What? How creatively bankrupt can you be? Ah! Then there's Gigantamax. So there's still that factor of only some Pokemon getting cool upgrades, but sometimes Gigantamax was worse than Dynamax. Why do they do this? And tying into Dynamax is the Max Raid mechanic. Pokemon Go ruined Pokemon. I'm serious. Because you can see, we got more tendrils. Tendrils from Go infecting the main series game. And one of the most obvious examples of that are the raids, because the raids came from Go. And how did you actually play the raids? You furiously tapped the screen. Mobile gaming. You furiously tapped the screen. And that's basically what you do in these raids, except 75% of the time your tapping does nothing because the enemy has a shield up. Your AI partners are completely worthless throughout the entire game. Solrock used cosmic power. Magikarp is unironically one of your better partners because it actually attacks. So you're noticing, wow, my partners really suck. Maybe I could have real life humans help me. I guess I'll just go online. What happened around this time? Nintendo Online became paid. When the Switch came out, online was free, but now you have to pay. You don't want to be partnered with Soul Rock and Magikarp. I mean, it's only $20 a year. It's cheaper than the other services. What a bargain. The online, of course, was completely broken. And I mean broken as in it just doesn't work. You would keep refreshing and just nothing would happen. It was completely non-functional. Well, it did one thing, it took your money. Now, back in high school, it was actually my dream to be a Pokemon YouTuber, kind of. I mean, I didn't really know what being a Pokemon YouTuber was like, but when I say I wanted to be a Pokemon YouTuber, I really meant I wanted to do Wi-Fi battles in front of an audience. I kind of do that now, a little bit with the Karen Challenge series. New episode soon, maybe. But Sword and Shield has made that dream actually impossible. For Sword and Shield, I don't know why they did this. The Wi-Fi battles have a 20 minute timer. 
hard cap to 20 minutes. Now that would be fine if it were a chess timer. A chess timer only counts down when you're actually deciding on a move. So it just encourages you to hurry up. The 20 minute timer counts animations. And remember, this is the game that has Dynamax, which takes like 30 seconds. It is impossible to play a singles match on Wi-Fi. It is impossible. You will never finish it. The strategy is just to knock out one of their opponent and then just stall forever. Like literally stall, just sit there, not doing anything, running out the timer. It is atrocious. Why did they do this? <laughs> oh, uh, instead of a third version, no guns in Britain, I guess. They have DLC. Is the DLC better than the base game? I mean, I guess. That's really not saying much though. And people will say like, well, isn't it better that they do DLC instead of separate versions? Well, yeah, I guess, but can I have a complete game in the first place? How about that? I think if the DLC had been included in Sword and Shield from the start, I would pay $30. Not for the DLC, like for the whole experience. Yeah, I'd maybe play that. The DLC, by the way, has follower Pokemon only in the DLC areas and it doesn't work. Like, it's just broken. Pokemon will disappear behind you because their move speed isn't calibrated correctly. So they did it correct in Let's Go, and then they messed it up. There's also just some truly bizarre, inexplicable technical foibles, where I have no idea how they even happened. So here's a fun fact, one of my most viewed videos is actually a video where I don't say anything, that sort of seems to be a trend, but I climb a ladder and the world freezes, because that's something that happens in this game. HMs are not in this game, which I, I guess is a good thing, but the personality and the life brought to the world by the ride Pokemon have been replaced by a hideous bicycle outfit and a bike that can go on water. So you basically only have Surf. It's just so boring. We haven't mentioned the wild area, so the wild area was one of the, the draws of the game, at least it was supposed to be. It was supposed to be this wide open wild area where you would encounter Pokemon in the wild, uh, no longer on a patch of grass. So it was sort of like bringing let's go mechanics into the main game. I think I mentioned this earlier. I remember I got to the wild area. I was like, oh, this is all right. So where's the next one? There isn't one. It's just a big field in the center of the map with literally Ocarina of Time graphics. The Mad Season Show thumbnail I was getting recommended is actually for Ocarina of Time, by the way. I'm gonna watch that after this. Yeah, some moves were also inexplicably dexited. Return? One of the only things making normal types not a complete joke is just gone. Pursuit is gone? I don't have any evidence for this, but I think Pursuit was removed for technical reasons. Because the game barely works as is. And Pursuit has a very unique functionality of hitting Pokemon as they switch out. No other move does that, and I think that probably caused some issues. It used to cause acid rain back in the day, it probably did something funky on the Switch and they just decided to cut it. I don't have any evidence for that, but it's true. Hidden power's also gone, but I don't really mind that that much. I might also be three Ferrothorns in a trench coat. Hidden but not forgotten. <laughs> Oh yeah, here's a question for you guys. Did you prefer Galar Mine 1 or Galar Mine 2? Ironically enough, for a game that touted unprecedented freedom and exploration, there's none of it. The most dead linear routes. The game is a big hallway. If you want to play a game that's a hallway, just play Final Fantasy 13. I can't believe I'm recommending you to actually play Final Fantasy 13. Let's start a poll. It's time for democracy. Will you be mine? Your options are Galar Mine 1 or Galar Mine 2, and that's it. Ah, uh, who can forget exploring Galar Mine 1 and finding Roly Coley? Or what about when you explored Galar Mine 2 and found Roly Coley? I will also say, you probably know by now that I really like Charizard. Unironically, I like Charizard, it's my favorite Pokemon. Uh, there's a Charizard on my hat. For me, number one Charizard fan JP. Why is Charizard in this game? <laughs> I have no idea why Leon's ace is Charizard. It makes no sense. 
it absolutely should have been like Dragapult or a Pokemon actually from Galar. What? Charizard fan slanders Charizard. This was definitely another one of their attempts to activate the sleeper agent programming, right? Champion Leon and his undefeatable Charizard. Charizard? Yeah, I picked Charizard. It's a dragon, right? Yeah, you, you could say that this is the game that finally broke the sleeper agent programming for a lot of us. I'm dressed as red, so I think it still has me, but it definitely got weaker. This game would be a lot better if they replaced Leon with RE4 Leon. Would you like to play Pokemon Sword and Shield? No thanks, bro. Where's everybody going? Voltorb flip? Okay, it's time, to, it's time to conclude the poll. And the people have spoken. What kind of loser would choose to inhabit Galar Mine 1 when 61% of the population favors Galar Mine 2? Some very bizarre choices in the decks for Sword and Shield. Why are there no Swans? Why are there no Yorkish Terriers? What's going on? The Pokemon already exist. Why aren't they in the game? Oh yeah, we haven't mentioned the story. It's bad. <laughs> it's bad. I guess we can start talking about cutscenes in these games because Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee did have cutscenes and this one doesn't. Tons of fades to black to just hide unanimated segments. And of course, the story itself just makes no sense. Uh, you're not even the main character. The main character is the Great Leon. I guess on his break from either defeating Los Illuminados or being a star wolf pilot uh, or being uh, an archer in a game where archers are the best. Any other Leons I missed? I think like one of the most jarring moments for me playing this game, you hear that there's a rogue Dynamax Pokemon that's going on a rampage that has to be stopped. And a couple people come out and they're like, oh no, what are we gonna do? And then Leon goes, don't worry, I'll handle this. And then he like runs through a tunnel. Then you go through the tunnel and then you're handed literally a PNG newspaper article saying that Leon defeated the Pokemon. Why am I even here? <laughs> what? I'm clearly not the main character. And of course we would be remiss not to mention the fact that this Nintendo Switch game does not have voice acting. In my opinion, a modern game, certainly a modern AAA release, should have voice acting. No excuses. If, you're, if it's like a small indie game, yeah, of course, it's expensive. Pokemon has all the money in the world. The only reason this game does not have voice acting is because they're cheap. And they rushed it, and they didn't want to add it in. It is insane that the opening cutscene of this game is literally a guy giving a speech in a stadium, and you're reading a text box. Like, you know right from the start that you're in trouble. The issue with X and Y was that the post game was unfinished. The issue with Sun and Moon was that the last third of the game was unfinished. Sword and Shield, they didn't finish anything. You can tell right away. And knowing that you don't have any voice actors, why would you have a gym leader whose whole thing is that he sings? I, I can't hear him! <laughs> For the people that say there shouldn't be voice acting, there's a couple reasons I've heard. One, it's not traditional. Games have to start adding voice acting at some point. Why don't they add it now? Another argument against it. The voice acting could be bad. Yeah, it could be bad. And it probably will be bad because it's Game Freak. That doesn't mean they shouldn't try. It'll probably be bad, so I guess we'll just give up. Okay, great. And of course, people saying that it would be too expensive because of all of the translations they'd have to do. They have so much money. And of course, Pokemon has voice actors in other aspects of the franchise, right? The anime? Could you imagine if the anime didn't have voices? The mobile cash grab scam Masters Sex has voice acting. Just get those guys to do it. Yeah, somebody mentioned it. Metroid literally got voice acting before Pokemon. Metroid. A game with one person who doesn't say anything. Remember me? Maybe they shouldn't have added voice acting. And we make fun of Sonic Adventure 2 voice acting cheesiness. At least it had it. Maria. Hey Cheese, remember how Resident Evil had full vi voice acting on the PlayStation 1? Oh, that was close. You were almost a Jill sandwich. 
I thought that you, Jill, the master of unlocking, might get more use out of this. <laughs> oh yeah, I, of course. Pokemon Stadium had voice acting, and one of the only good things about this game is the stadium setting. The gym battles are pretty hype. Could you imagine how hype they would be if they actually had an announcer? Like they did on the Nintendo 64? <laughs> Even if he couldn't pronounce Seismic Toss correctly, he said Seismic Toss. Seismic Toss! Oh yeah, we didn't mention Team Yell. Team Yell, uh, worst team in the entire game? Yeah, I'd say they're worse than Team Star. One of the issues with going to 3D is that a lot of the abstraction that you were able to do in 2D, you can no longer do. So obviously in 2D, all of the villainous goons were just direct clones of each other, but you sort of accepted it, right? In 3D, when you see that you're suddenly playing the Clone Wars, it is very strange. Like, why is every single male grunt just like this portly chav? Like, what is going on? The most shameless roadblocks where they're just cheering in front of a tunnel preventing you from going through? And I guess we can also mention there, what happened to the battle backgrounds? The backgrounds in this game suck. A ton of battles just happen in this strange, shapeless void. You couldn't make the backgrounds? I guess not. The story makes no sense. So, definitely not evil <laughs> Chairman Rose. Apparently, has to awaken uh, the Dynamax Pokemon, and it has a name, and cause the end of the world, like right now, because in a thousand years, there's gonna be an energy crisis. I mean, there's an energy crisis in our real world right now, it's gonna end in about 50 years, and nobody's taking steps about that. Chairman Rose is really forward thinking. It like interrupts the champion tournament to do this completely unrelated end of the world scenario. Leon throws one Pokeball and then like gives up. You can throw another Pokeball, bro. I guess there's legendary dogs. They did something. And of course, the evil plan is delivered to you in front of a PNG background because they didn't want to actually model a cityscape. Let's talk about the fan rewrite I read. So the fan rewrite was that Leon, who has this cape that he wears that's full of sponsors, is actually a sham. So when you actually do the champion battle against him, like, he sucks. And then you realize that Rose has been rigging all of his fights. The reason why he's been undefeated is because of corruption. And then the true champion is the secret queen of Galar, Marnie. None of that's true, of course, but I guess you can imagine. Can't forget the real royal family, Swordward and Shieldbird. It sounds like a joke, but unfortunately it's not. The movesets of the legendary dogs are also totally bogus. Why doesn't Zamazencha get body press? <laughs> Pressing question, why not? Also, shoutouts to Solrock and Lunatone not being in Sun and Moon. But I think Aegislash was in Sword and Shield. So there's that. Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl. I mean, I don't think there's gonna be any surprises here. Uh, they might actually be worse than Daipa. <laughs> Uh, let me be clear, I'd probably rather play Brilliant Diamond than Original Diamond. But keep in mind, these games came out in 2007, and these came out in... 2021. <laughs> so really, I'd rather not play either. People have been saying that Game Freak shouldn't be the ones to make the games, they should be entrusted to a different company. Well, they entrusted it to ILCA, I Love Computer Arts. Well, I don't love this game, you call this computer arts? Ah, oh, horrible! I don't think these games have any defenders. What's there to say? They remade the wrong game. I guess the reason why they decided to remake Diamond and Pearl instead of Platinum was so that they could sell you it twice. I'm ashamed they even sold me it once. So many issues with Daipa Remake could have been solved by just remaking Platinum? Like, they had the blueprint right there. What were they thinking? <laughs> so there's the obvious things, like how it doesn't have the Platinum Pokedex, how the gym leader teams are complete bogus, how the difficulty curve is a joke since they still have the experience share. Can't turn it off, by the way. But they didn't actually tune any of the levels. Then there's a completely absurd difficulty spike at the end. You go from literally fighting a dude with a Mantike after the last gym 
to fighting full teams where they have a focus sash. You probably don't even know what a focus sash is if you're a kid. I'm not gonna say that the Elite Four has competitive movesets, because try taking Belch Whiskash into a competitive battle and see how you do. But they definitely ramped up the difficulty way too fast, considering the difficulty of the rest of the game. To show you how far back they went to claw back the improvements from Platinum, the original Pokechi, your little app thing, was garbage, because it only had one button. It could only go forward. So if you accidentally cycled past the app you wanted, you had to go through every single app just to get back to the one you wanted and hope that you didn't cycle past it again. In Platinum, they fixed this with revolutionary technology known as a back button. So now you could both scroll forward and backwards. Great. In Diaper Remake, they took out the back button. Nice. Thanks. Wonderful. Great design. Why? <laughs> And of course, the game is completely broken. There are so many absurd game-breaking glitches. It's why I was able to do a full bonus Galactic Glitches episode on how completely borked these games are. But I will say that the game-breaking glitches at least don't affect the gameplay much. Like, the game itself mostly works, and if you go out of your way, you can break in all these other ways. So I don't really think I'm holding the broken state of the game against it that much. I mean, you should, but I'm being merciful. I'm describing a game that I say is one of the worst ever, but perhaps there's some heroism left in me. So the original Dipa was on a grid, because it was on the DS. And in Dipa Remake, you can use the control stick to move around, but it's still kind of on a grid. If you try to just move around with the control stick, you will constantly just bump into stuff and move incorrectly. It, it is very difficult to describe without actually playing the game. Don't play the game, by the way. But if you have had the misfortune of experiencing the wacky movement, there's nothing else like it, uh, in a bad way. Game Freak must have forced Ilka's hand with BDSP. I mean, it was directed by Masada, <laughs> so he is the ultimate villain. How is it not worse than Sword and Shield? Good question. It's a little bit prettier. Like, I really don't like the chibi style that they went with. I think it does not work, and they clearly just did it to save on cost, not to be faithful. But it does end up being less agonizing to your eyes than Sword and Shield. Oh, uh, we didn't mention this for Sword and Shield, but for whatever reason, Sword and Shield removed infinite use TMs halfway. Some of the more powerful ones were made into TRs, technical records, wow. And now if you do extra grinding and interact with the god-awful raid mechanic, you can teach someone Leaf Blade. Cool. And then in BDSP, they did this bizarre, like, middle ground, where TMs break, but they give you like five of them. And the balance is horrendous. The point that sticks out to me is that as soon as you get to Veilstone City, you can just buy Flamethrower, Ice Beam and Thunderbolt, incredibly powerful moves that you should not have access to that early in the game. The reason why you can buy them is because gambling is illegal, so you can no longer get them from the game corner. You can just buy them from the department store. Why do they do that? You can later, much later in the game, go and explore an optional area, the Fuego Ironworks, and at the very end of this dungeon, you get one Flamethrower TM that you could have bought for cheap about seven hours of gameplay earlier in infinite amounts. They did not care about this game at all, and it shows. The battle backgrounds look really nice though. Also, if you're an Onyx fan, you'll love this game because the Steel Gym has like eight Onyxes. Where's the Steelix? Hello? Anything else positive or negative to say about Dipa? Let me rephrase that. Anything else negative to say about Dipa? <laughs> Did I mention the Grand Underground? Oh, I actually haven't. We didn't talk about the Grand Underground at all. So their completely boneheaded method of introducing the Platinum decks was to expand the Underground. It's just a bunch of rooms where you can kind of, sort of, sometimes encounter Pokemon from the Platinum decks, but they don't actually register in your Pokedex until you beat the game. How about you just put the Platinum decks in the base game? Oh, the affection system. We should mention that. 
So in generation six, they added an affection system, which is not the same as friendship. So affection was optional in gen six and seven. By interacting with your Pokemon outside of battle, you rub them and then they like you more. You can also feed them. And this would give you certain bonuses in battle, incredibly powerful bonuses. But because it was optional, this really didn't matter. If you didn't want to do it, you didn't have to. And if you did do it, I think it did add to the world building. One of the really nice things about affection was when your Pokemon liked you, at the start of battle, it would like look back at you and like smile because it trusted you because you were friends. And then starting in Gen 8, th there's still affection, but it sucks. <laughs> First of all, it's not optional. It happens whether or not you wanted to. And instead of the nice little head turn where you actually felt connected to your Pokemon, they just do this super lazy bounce as if they were double kicking. Well, I feel like I got double kicked somewhere I can't say. All that is to say that forced affection mechanics in Daipa make the game even easier than it already was. Because affection gives you bonus crits, you can suddenly dodge things that would otherwise be undodgeable, you can cure status out of nowhere, and you can survive at 1 HP. Repeatedly, by the way. So you can just keep getting smashed at 1 HP and just not die if you're, if you're friendly enough. Okay, it might have been optional in Sword and Shield, because it only happens if you click Curry. So Daipa was the one that made it mandatory. One point in favor of BDSP, it killed HMs. Uh, they completely removed HMs, and instead you just have Bidoof do almost everything for you, except for Fly, which is Star Raptor. On the one hand, it's kind of a cute nod to the fact that Bidoof was the Star HM employee of the original Daipa, but on the other hand, they had Ride Pokemon, so it's still really lazy. I think the greatest failing of Daipa, you can see here, there's no reason to play Ruby and Sapphire. Just play Aorus, they're better. Why is Platinum better than Daipa? It should not be, right? This is a mistake. Oh, also following Pokemon are still broken, just like they are in Sword and Shield. So that's two games now where they just didn't fix the following mechanic, even though they did it correctly in Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee. One of the best things about Daipa Remake is that it's made in Unity. So that means that if you don't want to play Daipa, it's really easy to create the game you want to play. Don't tell Nintendo I said that. I mean, it's been a thing for all of these games so far, but like the versions are the same. I think the only difference between the Daipa games is the Legendary that you catch. That's literally it. You can change one flag in the game and get the other version. Wow. Pokemon Legends Arceus. Before I rank this, I'll say, if this game had come out one to one with no changes, hashtag no changes, in 2005 for the GameCube, it would be the best game on the entire list. But it didn't. It came out in 2022 for the Nintendo Switch. <laughs> Press down B to counter! Come at me, I'm ready to ban you! I'll take on all of you! Take this! Pokemon Legends Arceus is really fun for about 40 minutes. You cannot release a game of this quality in 2022. Pokemon Legends Arceus. It's a great idea. Shame about the game. Oh. Issues with Legends Arceus. There's a lot. We'll start with the easy stuff. The game looks like garbage. <laughs> it's so ugly. And it has a ton of technical issues. But at least the issues mostly just make the game uglier. At least the game works. And of course, when I say works, I don't mean that it's fun to play or engaging, I mean that it doesn't like break when you try to play it. Usually the things that you try and do actually happen, unless you're actually on Bascule Legion, in which case, no, it doesn't work. The presentation of the game is unacceptable. No voice acting, no cutscenes, they just fade to black. The story is boring and lame. Why is this an isekai? I was so excited to figure out about the origin of Pokeballs and what life was like in the world before we were actually friends with Pokemon. No, you just got a smartphone and you went back in time. And I, I guess spoiler warning here, but the game is like unfinished. What, what happens at the end? Can I go home, please? What about my friends? What about my family? Am I just stuck in this village? How do I charge my smartphone? Like what? They just don't end the story. 
the mechanics are so shallow. Yes. So let's get into the real criticisms about the game, because of course, Pokemon has never been about the graphics, right? Pokemon has never been about the story. It's always been about the gameplay. The gameplay sucks. <laughs> the gameplay sucks. What do you do in this game? You catch 20 Bidoof, and then you catch 20 Starlies, and then you do three battles with broken mechanics, and then the game is over. 60 US dollars. The battle system was a cool idea, but it just does not work. Agile style, I heard it gives you extra turns, I've never seen it. Strong style, I hear it gives you fewer turns, that's definitely true. If you do strong style, I hope you knock out the enemy because you're not getting another turn. And you probably won't knock out the enemy because it only gives you like a very minor power boost. They culled a lot of the moves in a way that was very clumsy because some moves removed just don't have any replacements. Why am I using Bulldoze on Garchomp? Trainer battles basically don't exist in this game. I understand why there aren't any, because Pokemon trainers aren't really a thing. It's also a good thing, because trainer battles are completely broken. For some reason, like, the sp your action speed, like, c continues between Pokemon? So you have no idea if the next Pokemon they send, they send out is gonna act first and just kill you before you can do anything. So it becomes like hit trading in a way that, to me, feels really unfair. Slow Pokemon also suck. They suck in the main game too, but they extra suck here. Best fight in the entire series does not get a D. Unfortunately, a fun fight is tied to the rest of the game. Pokemon fan baffled by RPG with turn order. So the turn order list, I think is a good idea. I liked Final Fantasy X, that had a turn order. It worked way better in that game because you had multiple party members, so the turn order was actually like something you had to pay attention to. And also the turn order didn't lie to you constantly. Because moves in Arceus can affect your action speed, the turn order just lies. So you can see that you're gonna get an action, but then the opponent uses headbutt on you, which reduces your action speed, doesn't tell you that. So then you actually get hit twice and you die. How could you have known that? You wouldn't. Great game. Multi-battles are in the game. I, I guess I can't really call them multi-battles. They're like gangbangs. You can get attacked by multiple Pokemon. That would be fine if there was any way to actually interact with multiple opponents. There is, right? It's called spread moves, but they're not in the game. So all you do is just sit there and get beat up by like 50 Manaphys and there's nothing you can do. Why not? <laughs> People praise the Pokemon catching mechanic. I'm not a fan. It's kind of like playing a really, really bad and basic first person shooter where your ammo is Pokeballs. And I guess your heavy balls just one shot everyone. Instead of headshots, you're trying to get back strikes. I'll reiterate, if this game had come out in 2005 for the GameCube, one to one, no changes. It would probably be the best game on the list, but it didn't. It came out in 2022 for the Switch. This game is so far behind the times. Pretty fitting, because it takes place in the past. The fights where you, as the trainer, actually fight the royal Pokemon or elite Pokemon. What are they called? Noble Pokemon? It's like baby's first Dark Souls. I think that's fine. Like, it's, it's okay. I understand it's a game for kids. But it's literally just bad Dark Souls. Oh, there it is! Step in the right direction! The first time that somebody said step in the right direction. I don't want to make too much fun of you, Mr. Waffle Man. I was just waiting for someone to say it. Step in the right direction has been the motto of Pokemon for over a decade. At least they tried something new. At least it was a step in the right direction. How many steps do we have to take until we actually get somewhere? Stuff that was good in Legends Arceus. Lots of quality of life changes. You can change your nickname anywhere. That's nice. You can relearn moves uh, at any point, which I think is totally fine as well. I like those changes. There were some good changes. One really great thing about Legends Arceus is that they finally ditched trade evos. You don't have to trade to get Gengar. You can just use a link cable, even though trading is in the game. So they could have forced you to get online to get the trade evos, but they actually put in the game a feature that would allow you to actually complete your single player game by yourself. And there's no way they would remove that feature in later games. More stuff I don't like about Legends Arceus. For a game that is all about catching 
oodles of the exact same Pokemon, there's no box sort feature. Well, actually, it's a pasture. How could you sort a pasture? Come on now. Can we please have a box sort feature? In Game Freak's endless quest to bully Regigigas into submission, which is a fighting type move it would be weak to, even though this game does not have abilities, Aww. Regigigas still has slow start. Lamau. <laughs> oh yeah, this game does have side quests, but they are the worst kind of side quest. You know what everyone hates about MMOs? When there's super basic side quests where it's like, go here and get me an orange berry. Go here and get me a raptor heart. That's the kind of quest this game has. I think this game was touted as open world, but it's really zone based, like Monster Hunter. Don't compare this game to Monster Hunter, Monster Hunter, Monster Hunter is way better. But I, I don't think that it needs to be open world. I think the fact that it's zone based is totally fine. The issue is that the zones suck. I didn't even talk about the world yet. There's nothing in it. I think that's all we have to say about the world. I wonder what's over here. Oh, it's nothing. I wonder what's over here. Oh, it's nothing. I wonder what's over here. Oh, it's a shiny! Let's go! Or an alpha Pokemon that knocks out your entire team. Shiny hunting was good. I did like the little sparkle. Can we please talk about the rival character and the actual characters in the game? We have yet to bring them up. What rival? Oh, the Pikachu girl? Is that a rival? What characters? Yeah. I do want to keep this list mostly spoiler free. If you are going to play Legends Arceus, if you're given the game for free and you're a Pokemon fan, yeah, maybe play it. It does have a very fun final battle. Uh, not quite uh, red tier, but it's cool. I think for the people who struggled with the final fight, uh, it does feel very unfair. Uh, it is probably one of the most unfair battles on paper in the entire franchise. It definitely feels more fair if you use the grit system. So something that the game doesn't really tell you EVs in the game are replaced by grit, which you get by like catching a bunch of Pokemon. And the grit bonuses are insane. A Pokemon with full grit is so much stronger than a base Pokemon. Which reminds me of a point that I didn't say earlier. One thing that I don't like about Scarlet and... Scarlet and Violet. Uh oh, foreshadowing. One thing that I don't like about Legends Arceus is that one of the best things about Pokemon is bonding with your Pokemon, right? You catch a Pokemon, and even though there's others of its species, the Pokemon you caught is the one that's with you for the journey, right? In Arceus, because you're encouraged to catch so many multiples of the same Pokemon, it sort of turns each member of that species into just like a stat sludge template. I really don't like that part of the game, especially because usually you can just go get an alpha Pokemon that's just better than the other Pokemon of its species. It has the same stats, but it's going to be at a much higher level and it'll probably have special moves. So you're encouraged to kind of just discard your friends. Friendship isn't magic, and I, I don't like that aspect of the game at all. You help your, you help the town become acquainted with Pokemon over time. That was kind of cool to see through your playthrough. Yeah, as you complete side quests, uh, po people in town become less and less afraid of Pokemon and interact with them more. I still think that Jubilife Village is just a completely dead hub world. Not nearly the amount of content that you would expect from a 2022 AAA release. Legends Arceus doesn't have following Pokemon, but it does have standing Pokemon. Uh, you can send out Pokemon and they'll they'll stand there. I guess they knew better than to try and make them walk since they've already proven twice that they can't do that. I think Arceus is probably the most controversial placement on this list. And more than any other game, it's definitely a victim of Game Freak's incompetence. It truly was released in the wrong generation. I hope they try again and make it better. I mean, I'm gonna say they couldn't do worse, but that's not true, they could. Most positive thing I can say about Legends Arceus. If they make a Legends Celebi, I mean, I'd probably play it. I don't know if it would be any good, but I wouldn't just start as a defeatist. The formula could work, but this time they bungled it. With Legends Arceus, at least they tried something new. Maybe the execution could have been better, but I think we can all agree that it was a step in the right direction. Speaking of segues, the very first open world game, Pokemon Scarlet and Violet for the Nintendo Switch. I don't think anybody's gonna contest this. Contests are gone, by the way. Oh boy, Pokemon Scarlet 
and Violet. Despite some technical issues. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> ah! Now, let me be clear. The only reason that Scarlet and Violet is above Sword and Shield is because of the context that I specifically played it in. Because I was in the extremely privileged position of playing this game with an audience. You guys, I was able to ring, ring out bad move, just an ounce of enjoyment out of this game. It, it's like The Room, where it's a group watching experience just to see how bad things get. I'm gonna lead, sorry, there's like a motorcycle outside. It must be me right on. <laughs> Something I'll say right now is you're probably going to hear a lot of what I'm about to say repackaged and gussied up in the eventual full Scarlet and Violet review. So get ready to hear echoes of what I say now. There's just so much to cover with this game. I think again, we'll start with the obvious, the graphical and technical issues. There's really no defense for these. This is the fifth game that Game Freak have made for the Switch. Uh, you, you wouldn't guess that. What in the world happened? I, I assume that because the development cycle overlapped with uh, the bug fire type pandemic, something went wrong. Something went more wrong than usual. People have said that this game is too big for the Switch. Let me remind you, this game came out at the same time as Xenoblade Chronicles 3. They're both for the Switch. It is purely a matter of technical incompetence. And when I say technical incompetence, I, I don't mean to like throw shade, nightshade, <laughs> at the developers as like people. I'm sure they're lovely. I'm sure they tried their best given the circumstances at hand. They're very bad at making games. They just don't make good games. Something that's definitely a marvel of Scarlet and Violet, normally you can choose between good visuals and good performance, but Game Freak does not compromise. You'll get terrible performance and terrible visuals. Take that. It is not an exaggeration to say that at best, Scarlet and Violet looks like a mediocre GameCube game. At worst, it looks like an N64 game. I am not kidding. Like in this image on screen, Mario's not in the game, sorry. Neither is the Super Mario 64 interface. The background, is from Mesagoza. Like, actually, it's not edited. There's really not much I can say about the graphics that hasn't been said already. I mean, you can see it. The game is hideous. Every second of the game assaults your eyes. This would barely be acceptable in 2005, but it's 2023. They touched up some of the models for the Pokemon. It's very clear which ones they actually spent time on. So Scarlet, has Koraidon, Violet has Miraidon, and they look fine. Ah, yes. Most of the Pokemon themselves look okay. As for their animations and the moves they use, not so okay. The cutscenes are a complete joke. There's this very strange crossfade effect where everything will freeze for a second and then move to the next frame. And they do that multiple times a scene. It is very distracting. I don't know why they do that. One of the most obvious ones is the bizarre shadow realm that the professor lives in. They're a PNG in the actual world. Then they'll fade to black. And then the professor will say like two lines. Then they'll fade to black. They'll be back to a PNG. Then they'll fade to black. They'll say like two lines. Then they'll fade to black. And then there'll be a PNG. And then they'll fade to black. And they'll say like two lines. Then they'll fade to black. And then there'll be a PNG. You think I'm exaggerating? This happens like seven times in one scene in the school. The cutscenes in Fire Emblem Engage look better than these ones. Fire Emblem Engage is a good game. I would actually recommend it to you. Skip the cutscenes though. Let's talk about the performance issues. The fact that I was able to make an entire glitch tier list for this game should be telling. This game makes me sick. I don't mean that in like a YouTube clickbait way. I mean that it physically makes me sick. Like the constant frame rate stuttering and flickering like it gives me a severe headache. <laughs> like actually playing this game for an audience was agony. That's just the frame rate. Pretty much every aspect of the game chugs i think one thing that defenders will say because of the term frame rate it's really to think of like oh 30 fps versus 60 fps and all these like gamer terms let's forget about the word frame the game lags it is laggy it is choppy it feels bad to play 
there's a scene early on in the school with probably the most one of the most infamous scenes in the game where it's just five FPS students kicking their legs. This is a cutscene. Why do they leave this in the game? Then there are cutscenes that literally have zero FPS. They are literally slideshows in a game that you paid $60 for in 2023. And the slideshow was at the beginning of the game. I spend a lot of time on the intros for my videos for a reason. The beginning and the end are so important. They are the most important, right? That's why at the end of Gen 4 tier list, that's why the Stealth Rock section is there. To have the beginning of the game be so blatantly unfinished really tells you all you need to know. They couldn't even prioritize the most important part of the game. They released trailers that just showcased how broken the game was. They couldn't hide it. The menus themselves don't even work. And RPGs are just a series of menus. How can you make the menus lag? I don't even know how. Game Freak found a way. I really don't know what else I can say about the performance. You can find oodles of glitch compilations online, just showing the game breaking in every which way. It's a lot worse if you try and do online. If you try to do the co-op, the game will crash. Guaranteed. <laughs> Guaranteed. For me, it crashed seven times during my playthrough. And for me, oh, it's funny, like, look how bad this game is, because I was playing with an audience. If I was playing it by myself, I would probably just be really sad. I've heard some arguments online how can you hate the glitches in Scarlet and Violet, but defend the glitches in Generation 1? Two important differences. Generation 1, it literally was a small indie studio trying their best. Not the case for Scarlet and Violet. Other point, almost all of the glitches in Red and Blue, at least the major game-breaking ones, you have to do intentionally using very specific, very convoluted setups. The glitches in Scarlet and Violet just happen to you. You just have to accept it. I don't want to play a glitchy mess. I want to play a Pokemon game. Let's get to some more of the most often touted online arguments. Performance issues aside, there's a good game under there. No. Uh, no. <laughs> the gameplay's terrible. Let's talk about the actual battles. What do you do? I mean, they're Pokemon battles, but worse. Do you like Megas? They're gone. Terra's okay, it's just way too difficult to actually access the different Terra types that would actually make it interesting. Because of the technical issues, battles are super slow. In a way that feels like there's something wrong, because of course there is! <laughs> Throw a Pokeball at a wild Pokemon, there's like a two second lag, and then the battle starts, after your trainer like warps forward like 10 feet. They removed set mode, feature that's been in the game, since Gen 1, it's the only game on this list that doesn't have set mode. The one that came out the most recently. Why? XP share. Can't turn it off yet again. Why not? The removal of set mode isn't the biggest deal because you can emulate set mode, Nintendo hates emulation, by just mashing B, right? When the switch prompt, just ignore it. Just don't switch. Let me pose this to you. Let's say I want to play in set mode. In a normal game, at the beginning of the game, I'd open the menu, I'd put it to set. That's it. If I want to play set in this game, after every single Pokemon that I faint, I have to press B. So that's going to be maybe two, three hundred times that I press B throughout the entire game to do nothing. To skip a prompt that I would always want to skip anyway. So two button presses, open the menu, set mode, versus hundreds of B button presses. How inconvenient. But of course, the main draw of this game is that finally, it's a seamless open world experience. There's no seams. I guess that's why it falls apart. This is the worst open world game I've ever played. At least the Ubisoft worlds are pretty. I think the most positive thing I can say about this game is that there is actually very good variety in the Pokemon you can get. Assuming that your favorite Pokemon is actually in the game, because Dexit is still a thing, you can probably go get it and add it to your team within like the first three gym badges. You can probably do that, that's great. What do you actually do in the open world? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing? Any counter arguments? There's just nothing to explore in the world. 
they sort of tried to give you an incentive to explore through the Golden Go coins. So to evolve Golden Go, you need to collect a bunch of like Gimme Ghoul coins. And these Gimme Ghouls are quite well hidden, you need a lot of them. But each little Gimme Ghoul you find is like three coins. You need 999 red and gold to reach Golden Go. But you could go to these easily located towers and just get 50 coins at once. So why would you ever explore? Just go to the towers. Easy. There are no dungeons. The closest we get to dungeons is the large cave before the psychic town, which I didn't even go to because by that point I already had climbing. I just skipped it. It's not like there's anything in the cave anyway. Of course, we have to mention the area names in this game are unacceptable. Remember Galar Mine 1? Remember Galar Mine 2? At least they had Galar in the name. What about North Province Area 1? North Province Area 2. North Province Area 3. South Province Area 1. South Province Area 2. South Province Area 3. I thought Arceus had a dead and empty world. At least that game had actual names for their locations, like Ponyta Meadow or whatever. One thing you could do in the open world is collect materials that you can then use to craft TMs, because of course, TMs are back to breakable. Why? So now there's just added busy work before you can actually use your TMs. Why did they do this? It seemed like an excuse to get you to go out and explore the world. It's just a chore. Why would you actually go explore this world? You can find items that you could just buy in a store anyway. Worthless. You could fight these bizarre trainers that just stand in the middle of a field doing nothing. Again, back in 2D, you could abstract that these trainers weren't actually doing nothing. And sometimes they weren't. They were like jogging, actually doing things. Why am I fighting some random businessman on a desert island? What are you doing, bro? I'm no longer bound by the office. The whole wide world is my office now. More slack. What? Susanna, the office worker. So free. I'm no longer bound by this game. Everybody stands there stiff as a board, just waiting for you to challenge them. They don't do anything. The world is dead. And that's not even mentioning the towns. These towns are an abomination. That's not fair to say, because abominations at least had a lot going on, right? They had a lot of limbs. These towns are ghost towns. It really is some strange sandwich dystopia where everybody just wanders around in a catatonic haze talking about picnics and sandwiches while they're being tailed by a quillfish that's got its like barbs in the back of their neck mind controlling them. It really is like a horror game. If you want to hide from these zombies, good luck, because there's no shelter. You can't go in any buildings. Playing Black and White 2, one of the starkest differences is that, yeah, you can go into buildings. Now, on the one hand, you can say that it's kind of annoying that you have to go into random buildings and talk like some random kid get the experience share. I get it. I get it. That can be inconvenient. It certainly is more convenient to not interact with anything ever and just have the game hand you everything. Would you do with what you're handed for free? I don't know. Nothing. Another thing that I think has been lost, and I, I realized this again replaying Black and White 2. In Black and White 2, there's these ticker tapes that display like the current date and like what's happening in the game currently. Now these things are in English because I'm playing the English version of the game. Something that happened, I believe it was in Sword and Shield for the first time. They replaced languages like text in the game with this hieroglyphic rune script. And I think the reason they did that was that they didn't have to do different languages for different releases. And I, I do think something is lost from that, but I will admit that's a bit of a nitpick. I think there's a moment in a tutorial, I think it's for Arceus, where they censor the text of an image so that they don't have to show it in multiple languages. I might be making that up. If I'm making it up, you'll never hear this in the premium. If I can find the image, you'll see it here. It was in Scarlet and Violet. I'm not like, I'm not going crazy, right? This actually happened. Where they literally blur the text of an image so they don't have to do it in different languages. 
In terms of balance, the game is yet again super easy. You can mash A and clear the entire game. I did it. No voice acting, but it's probably not a shock by this point. It's still really strange to have people giving completely silent lectures. Except I didn't charge you $60 for that. Let's talk about the open world format. So in Scarlet and Violet, you can go anywhere. Can you do anything? Well, you can die because there's no level scaling. What is the point of having an open world game where the only thing you can do out of order is get your ass kicked? Now I've heard some defenses of this. One is that if the world scales with you, then there's no sense of growth. That's a terrible argument because there's ways to make the world more difficult as it scales with you. Because making the game more difficult isn't just having the Pokemon be higher level. It's making them be higher level, having there be more of them, giving them better moves. There's very easy ways to make the game more difficult as you progress while still keeping a sense of progression. Yeah, Pokemon Crystal Clear, a ROM hack made by, I believe, one person, has level scaling in an open world game. They did it wonderfully. They made different teams for every gym leader based on how many badges you have, which is how level scaling works in the Pokemon world, by the way. And the thing is, this game does do level scaling, right? Nimona has an end game team at the start of the game, but she doesn't use it because she scales to your levels. Why don't the rest of the gym leaders do that? I guess it was too much work? So you'd have to make seven different teams for each gym leader. Do you think they had the budget to hire someone to do that? You could probably do that in an afternoon, in like two hours. I'm not even kidding. Before we talk about the story story, we'll just talk about how the story interacts with the gameplay. So there's three separate routes. There is Victory Road, and when I say Victory Road, I mean, that's what the gym circuit is called. There is no Victory Road in this game, it's been cut. Then there's the Starfall Street, which are five minigame bases that end with a boss fight. And then there's Path of the Titans? Path of Titans? There was something from World of Warcraft that was something Titans. And that's where you fight five Titan Pokemon. Dynamax is still in the game, don't worry. And then after each of those, you unlock an exploration ability. Victory Road is just gym battles. I, there's really nothing else I have to say about that. It's just gym battles. I guess each of the gyms is preceded by a little mini game. They're all terrible. And at the end, you fight the Elite Four. They're all in the same room. Best part about the Elite Four was always the memorable environments that each member had. Now, they've always been a little bit over the top. I don't know if you'd actually want to fight in a room filled with lava. Seems kind of dangerous, but the fact that they're all in the same sterile chamber for me is just such a disappointment. Now, you could say, oh, well, it's sterile on purpose because it's a school exam. Well, school is boring. Let's talk about Starfall Street. This should be pretty easy. So to beat the star bases, you mash the R button. Ah, that's it, right? I think we're done with the star base analysis. We can also mention that that interacts with the let's go mechanic, which is kind of like follower Pokemon. So follower Pokemon were broken in Sword and Shield, but I mean, they fixed it in Dipa, right? Oh, okay, well it was broken in Dipa. Oh, they fixed for Scarlet and Violet, right? No, they didn't. It's still broken. It's been three games in a row. It still doesn't work. The star bases is also a good time to bring up how unintuitive the intended level path is. Here it is on screen now. Couldn't figure this one out? You must just be bad at video games. When I saw the first Starmobile, I was excited because I was ready to see how it would be different at each star base. Of course, the difference is that it's a different color. The, the Titan path, it's probably the worst gameplay wise. So there's five bosses throughout the world that you have to defeat. I imagine they made them Titans because it was really easy to just make them big. Just scale up the model size. Wow, it's a boss. Incredible. They don't display their levels, so you have no idea how strong they are. You can try fighting them and then die, or try fighting them and then crush them because you have no idea whether or not you outlevel them. They can all be cheesed by using Salt Cure and starting Knackle Stacks. You can just do that. Even if you don't do that, it's still a 7v1 fight, so I don't really know how you lose. There's nothing special about these Pokemon. They're just big. They don't have any special mechanics. I think they have stat boosts. Who cares? The totem Pokemon at home. I guess we'll briefly talk about multiplayer. 
The 20 minute battle timer is still there, so... I mean, good luck playing singles. You can't. I guess they're encouraging you to play doubles. Are there double battles in this game? There's literally four. And they're all unlosable. Because you get free stat boost during them. Fun. Only good part about Scarlet and Violet was multiplayer and shiny hunting. Let's talk about the multiplayer. The multiplayer in this game is useless. So let me ask you a question. What do you do in multiplayer? You can't do anything. The only thing you can do in multiplayer is participate in raids together. Raids, by the way, of course, are completely broken. <laughs> Remember how bad raids were in Sword and Shield? Well, congratulations, you're a loser. They made them even worse. It is this abominable, grotesque hybrid between turn-based, but also timer-based? You never know who's gonna get an action. The opponent can die and then come back? The camera never works. Chances are the raid doesn't even start because people have connection issues. By the way, if anybody ever crashes during your multiplayer session, which they will, you can't just invite them back. You have to stop the multiplayer session and start it again. And when you start a multiplayer session, you get teleported to a random Pokemon Center. Why? The one thing that multiplayer consistently does is it lets you crash the game. So if you want to crash the game for content, do multiplayer. You're going to crash within 30 minutes. I guarantee it. Before I leave your circle, can I get one of your quillfish? Yeah, sure. That's... If you ask nicely, okay? These things are valuable. <laughs> Uh-oh. Why didn't restrict you to one? Charizard can breed and did was in this game? I have no idea. Oh, I got the... I got the crash. One thing that multiplayer does enable you to do is to catch Pokemon from the opposing version if somebody in your party is from that version. Would rather they just give us all the Pokemon in one game, but they can't do that. By the way, this mechanic does work in Area Zero, but you can't see your partner in Area Zero. So what you can do is stream the game and then have your party members stream snipe you so that you can stay next to each other and catch the opposing Paradox Pokemon. Great gameplay. I'd alluded to earlier about saying that making the online worse was intentional, and I'll explain it now. They had a good multiplayer system. In the PSS, the player search system, they gutted it, I think, on purpose. It's the same reason why they ripped the GTS out of the game and split it into a mobile app and the paid Pokemon Home service. You can use Pokemon Home without paying for it, but it sucks. You'd have to pay for full functionality. By the way, there's still no home support at the time that this video goes up. It's been, what, six months? Still doesn't exist. They even said earlier, coming in early 2023. Well, it's April 30th. I'm waiting. If you want to pay monthly and get nothing, why don't you just become a Patreon? Link in the description. The reason why trading sucks now is because they don't want you to be able to complete the game with one copy. They want you to just give up and buy both. And they're trying to prod you in that direction. I'm tired of being prodded. Stop prodding me. Now the video's been going for a while. You're probably feeling a little peckish. Would you like a sandwich? No. I hope you like sandwiches. Because this game is sandwich centric. It is actually absurd how much of this game is about sandwiches. Like half the story, I'm not kidding, is about sandwiches. And sandwiches are a major gameplay mechanic. Making sandwiches is how you get certain buffs that allow you to find certain Pokemon easier. Some Pokemon are almost impossible to find without the right ingredients in your sandwich. It's crazy, they even added a bread dog Pokemon? I like sandwiches in real life, but by the end of this, I was just saying, enough, man. And some of these sandwiches do pretty insane things. I think you can make a sausage sandwich and launch yourself into outer space to fight Rayquaza. Now you're probably thinking, that's ridiculous and that I'm lying to you? You're right, it's not true. Rayquaza's not in the game. You can build a sausage sandwich and go to space though. And the sandwich eating animation is an embarrassment. I think they should have just faded to black. That would have been better. So the graphics are bad. The gameplay is bad. 
But at least the story's good, right? No. The story sucks. <laughs> I will never understand how people say that this story, forget about good, even approaches acceptable. Let's talk about Victory Road's story. There is no story. Next. Okay, I guess we can talk about Nimona's development. So she's psychotic. She just has this unquenchable bloodlust where all she wants to do is fight, fight, fight. And like near the end of the game, because there's no voice acting, there's this unhinged scene where she just laughs in your face. And that's the end of Victory Road. Cool. Let's talk about Starfall Street. People defend that story. It's garbage. <laughs> it's garbage. Even if you're an incredibly skilled storyteller, it's going to be difficult to tell a non-linear story. And they are not good storytellers. It's about bullying? So first of all, with the exception of the weeb ninja kid, none of these kids are bullyable. You got like a hot goth girl? You got like a superstar wrestler? Nobody would bully these kids. You got a rich kid? What? The big issue is that there were bullies, and then the bullied fought back, but became villainized. Okay, Ooh. apparently the old administration of the school knew about this, but didn't stop it. And then, when all of this came to light, every single faculty member quit. How do you have a school with 100% turnover, where all of the new staff, including the headmaster, has no idea what happened. It's terrible. This is not nitpicking. The core of the story makes no sense. Maybe you sympathize with Penny. Maybe I would if she actually said anything, but nobody does. There's no voice acting. It's just endless text that you mash through, but they added a sepia filter. So I guess it's nostalgic. I don't know. Also, as we later learn in Area Zero, Penny wasn't bullied hard enough. She's awful. There's a moment where Arvis, Arvin, whatever his name is, talks about his missing parents. And then Penny's like, oh, well, my parent calls me a nickname I don't like. Awful. I don't like you. Uh, probably the hottest take I'm going to say about Scarlet and Violet. People say that, well, at least the Arvin storyline is good. No, it's not. I just call him Arvis because Arvis is from an actually good game. So I don't know Arvis, and I don't know his dog, so I don't care about them. Arvis should have been the main character. The game should have started in Area Zero with Mabostif getting wounded. And that might have been the base for a good game. He's just this random guy you meet in five copy-pasted cutscenes, shows you his sick dog, and you're supposed to feel bad. I don't. Maybe I would if in one of the very few cutscenes that this game actually has, there was voice acting about him being glad to cure his sick dog. You cannot get me to read text boxes in a 2023 AAA game about some guy being sad about his dog. I don't care. I'm sorry. I guess I'm a heartless. It just feels like very cheap emotional manipulation. Don't manipulate me, okay? And don't cheap shot me either. That's a four second stun. Only one thing left to talk about in Scarlet and Violet. It's the part that most people, including me, consider to be the best part of the game, which is Area Zero. Is Area Zero good? No. But it is the best part of the game. I think it's very ironic that the part of the game that everyone praises in this open world game is the most linear segments. <laughs> so once you complete the three separate paths, you continue the only true path, which was the Arvis one, he's the main character, where you descend into Area Zero. So I've got some news for you. If you like Area Zero, they've been making games where the entire game is Area Zero, but better. They're called JRPGs. Just go play one of those. It's gonna blow your mind. For the whole game, the characters are good. For the whole game, the music is good. For the whole game, there are stakes. Why are you playing Scarlet and Violet? In fact, I've got a direct recommendation for you. If you want a game where you walk in a hallway with your friends and there are crystals, why don't you play Final Fantasy 13? People love that game. For Area Zero defenders, let me ask. What do you actually do in Area Zero? 
you walk down a very big spiral with unreadable text that scrolls way too fast, and then you fight Paradox Pokemon. 12v1, so it's a real challenge. The final boss is kind of fun. It's definitely the best part of the game. But again, as with everything else in this game, it's about 15 years too late. The atmosphere in Area Zero was sublime, and the fact it wasn't shown in the trailers made it so much better. Sublime? I'd agree with the sub part. Sub bar. It's a grassy field with mist. You like Venomoth? You can catch a Venomoth. You like Slitherwing? I do. You can catch Slitherwing. It really is just the worst JRPG you ever played in your life. We're gonna use Future Sight here. I see it! DLC has been announced for Scarlet and Violet. We have no idea what it's gonna be like. We just know that it's gonna cost 35 US dollars. I have no hopes for it. <laughs> I fully expect that it's going to be terrible, but I'll play it because apparently I've chosen to chain myself to a chain of memories. I could have said that better. So here's the thing for me in particular, making these lists, playing these games, I have to do it whether I want to or not because it's my job. It's why I try to do things sometimes that aren't about Pokemon. It's why I do these Fire Emblem videos that not really many people watch. It's because I do not want to be shackled to this franchise considering the direction it's been going in. You can see pretty much that the list is old games good, new games bad. It's a complaint that's been repeated a lot uh, because it's true. <laughs> At least for Pokemon, it's true. When I tell people about Scarlet and Violet, the graphics are bad. Okay, well, it's never been about the graphics. The gameplay's bad. Okay, well, it's never been about the gameplay. The performance is bad. Well, it's never been about the performance. The story's bad. It's never been about the story. So what is it about? <laughs> Why would you play this game? I'm not sure. In my opinion, you shouldn't. There's a lot of words you could use to describe Scarlet and Violet. You could say that it's rushed. You could say that it's incomplete, that it's greedy, that it's incompetent. These are all negative words, by the way, but I think maybe the most fitting word to describe it, for me at least, is insulting. It really does feel like Game Freak saying, hey, you like Pokemon? Then buy this game. They know that their sleeper agent programming has been effective. They know that I, I love Charizard and that I'll buy any game they put out. And they're right, I did buy it. <laughs> And so did millions of others who will defend it. So to answer the question that this entire list was started by, do you like Pokemon? I think that yes, I do. But I just wish that Pokemon liked me.